Chapter Fifty Six of the Story Book of Science. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. The Story Book of Science by Jean Henri Fabre. Translated by Florence Bicknell. Chapter Fifty Six the year and its seasons you told us said claire that at the same time the earth turns on its axis it travels around the sun yes it takes three hundred and sixty-five days for that journey it makes three hundred and sixty-five pirouettes on its axis in accomplishing a journey round the sun the time spent in this journey makes just a year the earth takes one day of twenty-four hours to turn on its axis one year to turn round the sun said jules that is it imagine yourself turning around a circular table the centre of which is occupied by a lamp representing the sun while you represent the earth each of your walks around the table is one year to represent things exactly you must turn on your heels three hundred and sixty-five times while you circle the table once it is as if the earth waltzed around the sun emil suggested the comparison is not so well chosen as it might be, but it is exact. It shows that in spite of the giddiness of his age, Emil has understood perfectly. A year is divided into twelve months, which are January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December. The unequal length of the months is sometimes confusing. Some have thirty-one days, others thirty. February has twenty-eight or twenty-nine, according to the year. For my part, said Claire, I should find it hard to tell whether May, September, and any other months of thirty or thirty-one days. How can one remember which months of thirty-one days and which thirty? A natural calendar, engraved on our hands, teaches us in a very simple way. Close the fist of the left hand. At the knuckles the four fingers, other than the thumb, form each a bump separated by a hollow from the next bump place the index finger of the right hand in turn on these bumps and hollows beginning with the little finger and at the same time name the months of the year in order january february march etc when the series of the four fingers is exhausted return to the starting point and continue naming the twelve months on the bumps and hollows well all the months corresponding to the bumps of thirty-one days all those corresponding to the hollows thirty you must expect february answering to the first hollow that has twenty-eight or twenty-nine days according to the year let me try posed claire we'll see how many days may has january bump february hollow march bump april hollow may bump may has thirty-one days it is as easy as that said her uncle my turn now interposed jules let us try september january bump february hollow march bump april hollow may bump june hollow july bump and now i am at the end of my hand now begin again and go on naming the months uncle paul instructed him you go on at the same point where you began yes all right august bump there are two bumps in succession there are then two months together july and august that have thirty-one days yes i will begin again august bump september hollow september has thirty days why has february sometimes twenty-eight and sometimes twenty-nine days asked claire i must tell you that the earth does not take exactly three hundred and sixty-five days to turn around the sun it takes nearly six hours more to make up these six hours that were disregarded at first in order to have a round number of days in the year they are reckoned in every four years and the additional day they make altogether is added to february which then becomes twenty-nine days long instead of twenty-eight. So, for three years running, February has twenty-eight days, and the fourth year it has twenty-nine. Exactly. Remember, too, that the years when February has twenty-nine days are called leap years. And the seasons? queried Jules. For reasons that would be a little too difficult for you to understand yet, the annual journey of the earth around the sun causes the seasons, and the unequal length of days and nights there are four seasons of three months each spring summer autumn and winter spring is from about march twentieth to june twenty first summer from june twenty first to september twenty second 
autumn from september twenty second to december twenty first winter from december twenty first to march twentieth on march twentieth and september twenty second the sun is visible twelve hours and invisible twelve hours from one end of the earth to the other the twenty first of june is for us the time of the longest days and shortest nights the sun is visible sixteen hours and invisible eight hours farther north the length of the day increases and that of the night diminishes there are countries where the sun earlier riser than here rises at two o'clock in the morning and sets at ten o'clock at night still others where the time of its rising and that of its setting are so close together that the sun has hardly sunk below the apparent edge of the sky before it appears again finally at the very pole of the earth that is to say at the point that remains stationary like the end of the axle of a wheel while all the rest turns one could witness the wonderful spectacle of a sun that is not set that turns round the spectator for six whole months equally visible at midnight and midday in those countries there is no longer any night on the twenty first of december we have a state of affairs just the reverse of that observed in june with us the sun rises at eight o'clock in the morning at four in the afternoon it is already set that is eight hours of day for sixteen of night farther north there are now nights of eighteen twenty twenty two hours and corresponding days of six four and two hours in the neighborhood of the pole the sun does not even show itself and there is no longer any daylight for six months there is the same darkness in the middle of the day as at midnight and do people live in that country of the pole where the year is composed of a day lasting six months and a night of six months asked jules no up to this time man has not been able to reach the pole on account of the horrible cold there but there are countries more or less near the pole which are inhabited when winter comes wine beer and other beverages turn into blocks of ice in their casks a glass of water thrown into the air falls back in flakes of snow the moisture of the breath becomes needles of rime at the opening of the nostrils the sea itself freezes to a great depth and thus increases the apparent extent of the dry land which it resembles having like it its fields of snow and mountains of ice for whole months the sun does not show itself and there is no difference between day and night or rather it is one long night the same at midday as at midnight however when the weather is fine darkness is not complete the light of the moon and stars augmented by the whiteness of the snow produces a kind of semi-daylight sufficient for seeing but this wan light and sledges drawn in disorderly fashion by teams of dogs the people of these dark regions hunt what scanty game there is fishing furnishes them more abundant food fish dried stored half decayed and rancid whales blubber are their habitual food for fuel for their hearths their dependence is again on their fishing which supplies them with fish bones and slices of blubber here in short wood is unknown no tree however hardy can resist the rigors of winter willows birches dwarf to insignificant underbrush venture far as the southern extremities of lapland with the cultivation of barley the hardiest of cultivated plants ceases beyond this point all woody vegetation ceases and during the summer there are found only occasional tufts of grass and moss hastily ripening their seeds in the sheltered hollows of the rocks further on the summer is too short for the snow and ice to melt completely the ground is never bare and all vegetation is impossible oh the doleful countries cried emil one more question uncle in travelling around the sun does the earth go fast it takes a year for the entire tour but as it circles at an enormous distance from the sun a distance of thirty-eight millions of leagues it must travel this wide circle with a speed beyond your power to conceive this speed is twenty-seven thousand leagues an hour in the same time the fastest locomotive goes about fifteen leagues compare and judge what exclaimed jules the immense ball of which we have never been able to comprehend the frightful weight travels in the sky with such rapidity yes my friend with a speed of twenty-seven thousand leagues an hour the terrestrial ball goes rolling through space without axle without support always on the ideal line that has been given to it for its race-track who caused it to move so rapidly that the very thought of it makes you feel giddy let us bow the head my children it is the power of god End of chapter 56 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Chapter 57 of the Storybook of Science This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Perschel. The Storybook of Science by Jean Henri Fabry. Translated by Florence Bicknell. Chapter 57 Belladonna Berries. Bad news was circulating from house to house in the village. Here is what they were saying. That day they had put little Louis into his first trousers. They had pockets and shiny buttons. In his new costume, Louis was a little awkward, but much pleased. He admired the buttons that shone in the sun. He kept turning his pockets inside out to see if there was room enough for all his playthings. What made him the happiest was a tin watch, always marking the same hour. His brother, Joseph, two years older, was also much pleased. Now that Louis was dressed like him, nothing prevented his taking him to the woods, where there were birds' nests and strawberries. They owned in common a lamb whiter than the snow, with a pretty little bell at its neck. The two brothers were to take it to the meadow. Some lunch was packed in a basket. They kissed their mother, who advised them not to go far. Take care of your brother, she said to Joseph. Hold him by the hand and come back soon. They started. Joseph carried the basket. Louis led the lamb. From the door their mother watched them going off, herself happy in their joy. Every now and then the children turned to smile at her. Then they disappeared at the turn of the path. They reached the meadow. The lamb frolics on the grass. Joseph and Louis run after butterflies in the midst of a clump of tall trees. Oh, the beautiful cherries, exclaimed Louis suddenly. See how big and black they are. Cherries, cherries, we are going to have a feast. Let us pick some to eat. There were, in fact, some large berries of a dark violet hue on the low plants. How small these cherry trees are, answered Joseph. I have never seen any like them. We shan't have to climb the tree for them, and you won't tear your new trousers. Louis picked one of the berries and put it into his mouth. It was insipid and Swedish. These cherries are not ripe says little Louis, spitting it out. Taste this one, answers Joseph, giving him one that felt very soft. It is ripe. Louis tastes it and spits it out. No, they are not at all good, repeats the little boy. Not good, not good, says Joseph. You will see. He eats one, then another, then another still, then a fourth, and then a fifth. At the sixth, he is obliged to stop. Decidedly, they were not good. It is true, they are not very ripe. But let's pick some all the same. We'll let them ripen in the basket. They gathered a handful or two of these black berries, then began running after butterflies. The cherries were forgotten. An hour later, Simon, who was returning from the mill with his donkey, found two little children, seated at the foot of the hedge, crying aloud and clasping each other. At their feet, a lamb was lying and bleeding plaintively, and the younger was saying to the other, Joseph, get up, we will go home. The elder tried to rise, but his legs, seized with a convulsive trembling, could not support him. Joseph, Joseph, speak to me, said the poor little one. Speak to me. And Joseph... His teeth chattering looked at his brother with eyes so big they frightened him. There is one more apple in the basket. Would you like it? I will give you all of it, went on the little fellow, his cheeks bathed in tears, and the elder trembled and then became rigid by fits and starts and stared fixedly with eyes growing ever larger and larger. It was then that Simon passed. He put the two children on the donkey, took the basket, and, followed by the lamb, hastened to the village. When the unhappy mother saw Joseph, her dear Joseph, so well a few hours before, so rejoiced at taking his brother for a walk, and now unconscious, 
dying. It was a scene to melt the heart. My God, my God, cried she, crazed with grief. Take me and leave my son. Oh, my Joseph, oh, my poor Joseph. And covering him with kisses, she burst into cries of despair. The doctor was summoned. The basket in which were still some of the blackberries mistaken for cherries explained to him the cause of the sad event. Deadly nightshade! Great God! he exclaimed under his breath. Alas! It is too late. Broken-hearted, he ordered a potion, the efficacy of which he could not count on, for the poison had made irreparable progress. And, in fact, an hour later, while the mother, on her knees at the foot of the bed, was praying and weeping, a little hand was stretched out from under the coverings and placed all cold in hers. It was the last goodbye. Joseph was dead. The next day they buried the poor little one. The whole village attended the funeral. Emile and Jules returned from the cemetery so sad that for several days they did not think of asking their uncle the cause of this lamentable accident. Since then, in the house of mourning, little Louis stops playing every now and then and begins to cry, despite his beautiful tin watch. He has been told that Joseph has gone far away and that he will come back some day. Mother, he says sometimes, when will Joseph come back? I am tired of playing alone. His mother kisses him and, covering her face with a corner of her apron, sheds hot tears. Don't you love Joseph any more? And is that why you cry when I speak of him? asks the poor little innocent. And his mother, overwhelmed, tries in vain to stifle her sobs. End of chapter 57 Belladonna Berries Read by Sarah Parshall Chapter 58 of The Storybook of Science. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Storybook of Science by Jean-Henri Fabre. Translated by Florence Bicknell. Chapter 58. Poisonous Plants. The death of poor Joseph had spread consternation through the village. If children left the house and went off into the fields, there was constant anxiety until they returned. They might find poisonous plants that would tempt them with their flowers or their berries and poison them. Many said, with reason, that the best way to prevent these terrible accidents was to know the dangerous plants and teach the children to beware of them. They went and found Maitre Paul, whose great knowledge was appreciated by all, and asked him to teach them the poisonous plants of the neighborhood. So, Sunday evening, there was a numerous gathering at Uncle Paul's. Besides his two nephews and his niece, Jacques and Mother Ambrosine, there were Simon, who had come upon the two unfortunate children on his way home from the mill, Jean the miller, André the plowman, Philippe the vine-dresser, Antoine, Matthew, and many others. The day before, Uncle Paul had taken a walk in the country to gather the plants he was to talk about. A large bunch of the principal poisonous plants, some in blossom, others with berries, were in a pitcher of water on the table. "'There are people, my friends,' he began, "'who shut their eyes so as not to see danger, and think themselves safe because they willfully ignore peril.' There are others who inform themselves about what may be a menace to them, persuaded that one warned person may be worth two unwarned. You belong to this latter class, and I congratulate you. Countless ills lie in wait for us. Let us try to diminish their number by our vigilance, instead of giving ourselves up to lazy carelessness. Now that a frightful misfortune has overtaken one of our families, who does not realize the extreme importance of our all-knowing, so as to avoid them, these terrible plants that claim victims every year. 
if this knowledge was more extended, the poor little fellow whose loss we now lament would still be his mother's consolation. Ah, unfortunate child! Uncle Paul, whom thunder never caused even to knit his brows, had tears in his eyes, and his voice trembled. The good Simon, who had seen the two children in each other's arms under the hedge, felt more moved than the others at this recollection. He pulled down the broad rim of his hat to hide the big tears that were rolling down his rough cheeks, bronzed by the sun. After a few moments of silence, Uncle Paul continued. The death of the unfortunate little boy was caused by belladonna. It is a rather large weed with reddish bell-shaped flowers. The berries are round, purplish-black, and resemble cherries. The leaves are oval and pointed at the end. The whole plant has a nauseous odour and a sombre appearance, as if to announce the poison it conceals. The berries particularly are dangerous, because they may tempt children by their resemblance to cherries and their sweetish taste. Enlargement of the pupil of the eye and a dull fixed stare are the characteristics of belladonna poisoning. Paul took from the bouquet in the pitcher a sprig of belladonna and passed it around in the audience, so that each one could examine the plant closely. "'What do you say that is called?' asked Jean. "'Belladonna. "'Belladonna. Good. I know that weed. I have often found it near the mill, in shady places. Who would believe those pretty cherries held such a frightful poison?' Here André asked, "'What does the word belladonna mean?' "'It is an Italian word meaning fine lady.' Formerly, it seems, ladies used the juice of this plant to keep their complexion white. That is a property that does not concern our brown skin. What concerns us is this confounded berry which may tempt our children. Are not our herds in danger when this weed grows in pastures? Antoine next inquired. It is very seldom that animals touch poisonous plants. They avoid browsing what might harm them, warned by the odour, and above all by instinct. This other plant with large leaves, whose flowers, red on the outside and spotted on the inside with white and purple, are arranged in a long and magnificent cluster, almost as high as a man, is called digitalis. The flowers have the form of long, tun-bellied bells, or rather of glove fingers. Therefore it is called by different names, all referring to this peculiarity. "'If I am not mistaken,' said Jean, "'it is what we call foxglove. "'It is common on the edges of woods.' "'We call it foxglove on account of its resemblance "'to the thumb of a glove. "'For the same reason, it has elsewhere the name of gloves of Notre Dame, "'gloves of the Virgin, and fingerstall. "'The name digitalis, borrowed from the Latin, "'also refers to the finger-shaped flower. "'It is a great pity that fine plant is poisonous,' commented Simon, it would be a pleasure to see it in our gardens. It is, indeed, cultivated as an ornamental plant, but in gardens under stricter vigilance than ours. As for us, my friends, who hardly have time to watch over flowers, we shall do well not to put digitalis within reach of children by introducing it in our gardens. The whole plant is poisonous. It has the singular property of slowing up the beating of the heart, and finally stopping it. It is unnecessary to tell you that, when the heart no longer beats, all is over. Hemlock is still more dangerous. Its finely divided leaves resemble those of chervil and parsley. This resemblance has often occasioned fatal mistakes, all the easier because the formidable plant grows in the hedges of enclosures, and even in our gardens. A plain enough characteristic, however, enables us to distinguish the poisonous weed from the two pot herbs that resemble it. That is the odour. Rub that tuft of hemlock in your hands, Simon, and smell. Oof, said Simon, that smells very bad. Parsley and chervil have not that horrid odour. When one is warned, no mistake can be made, in my opinion. Yes, when one is warned, but those who are not take no account of the smell, and mistake hemlock for parsley or chervil. It is in order to be warned that you are listening to me this evening." 
"'You are doing us a great service, Maître Paul,' said Jean, "'by putting us on our guard against these dangerous plants. "'Every one at home ought to know what you have just taught us, "'so as not to gather a salad of hemlock instead of chervil.' "'There are two kinds of hemlock. "'One, called the great hemlock, "'is found in damp and uncultivated places. "'It is very like chervil. "'Its stems are marked with black or reddish spots. "'The other, called the little hemlock, resembles parsley. "'It grows in cultivated fields, hedges, and gardens. "'Both have a nauseating odour. "'Now, here is a poisonous plant very easy to recognise. "'It is the arum, or, as it is commonly called, cuckoo pint, or calf's foot. "'The arum is common in hedges. "'The leaves are very broad and shaped like a large lance-head. The blossom is shaped like a donkey's ear. It is a large yellowish trumpet, from the bottom of which rises a fleshy rod that might be taken for a little finger of butter. This strange flower is succeeded by a bunch of berries as large as peas, and of a splendid red colour. The whole plant has an unbearable burning taste. "'Let me tell you, Maître Paul,' put in Matthew, "'what happened one day to my little Lucien.' Coming home from school, he saw in the hedge those large flowers you are speaking of, like donkey's ears. The fleshy rod in the middle looked to him like something good to eat. You have just compared it to a little finger of butter. The thoughtless creature was taken with its looks. He bit into the deceitful finger of butter. What had he done? In a moment his tongue began to burn, as if he had bitten a red-hot coal. I saw him come home spitting and making faces. He won't be taken in again, you may be sure. Luckily he hadn't swallowed the piece. The next morning he was all right. A similar burning flavour is found in the white milk juice that runs from the euphorbia when cut. The euphorbia are plants of mean appearance, very common everywhere. Their flowers, small and yellowish, grow in a head, the even branches of which radiate at the top of the stem. These plants are easily recognized by their white juice, their milk, which runs in abundance from the cut stems. The juice is dangerous, even on the skin alone, if it is tender. Its acrid burning taste is its sufficient characteristic. The aconites, like digitalis, are fine plants, which for their beauty have been introduced in gardens, notwithstanding the violence of their poison. They are found in hilly countries. Their blossoms are blue or yellow, helmet-shaped, and grow in an elegant terminal bunch of the finest effect. Their leaves, of a lustrous green, are cut out in radiating sprays. The aconites are very poisonous. The violence of their poison has given them the name of dog's bane and wolf's bane. History tells us that formerly arrowheads and lance-heads were soaked in the juice of the aconites to poison the wounds made in war and to make them mortal. There is sometimes cultivated in our gardens a shrub with large shiny leaves, which do not fall in winter, and with black oval berries as large as acorns. It is the cherry bay. All its parts, leaves, flowers, and berries, have the odour of bitter almonds and peach kernels. The leaves of the cherry bay are sometimes used to give their perfume to cream and milk products. They should be used only with great prudence, for the cherry bay is extremely poisonous. They even say one has only to remain some time in its shade to become indisposed from its exhalations of a bitter almond odour. In autumn there is seen in abundance, in damp fields, a large and beautiful flower, rose or lilac in colour, that rises from the ground alone, without stem or leaves. It is the colchicum, also called meadow saffron, or velotte, also veluse, because it blossoms on the eve of the cold season. If you dig a little way down, you will find that this flower starts from a rather large bulb, covered with a brown skin. Colchicum is poisonous, so cows never touch it. Its bulb is still more poisonous. But we have talked enough about harmful plants for today. I should be afraid of befogging your memories, were I to enter into more details. Next Sunday I will expect you again, my friends, and we'll talk to you about mushrooms. End of chapter 58. Read by Kara Schallenberg, www.kra.org. 
on Friday, July 12, 2013, in San Diego, California. Chapter 59 of the Storybook of Science. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The Storybook of Science by Jean Henri Fabre. Translated by Florence Bicknell. The Blossom. Yes, they had listened very attentively the day before, when Uncle Paul told them all about poisonous plants. Who would not listen to a talk on flowers? Jules and Claire, however, would have been glad to hear more. How are the flowers made that their uncle showed them yesterday? What is to be seen inside them? Of what use are they to the plant? Under the big elder tree in the garden, their uncle talked to them as follows. Let us begin with the blossoms of the digitalis, which I spoke of yesterday. Here is one. It has, as you see, almost the form of a glove finger, or better, of a long-pointed cap. Emile could put one onto his little finger. There would be plenty of room. It is purplish-red in color. Inside it has spots of dark red encircled with white. The red glove fingers rises from the center of a circle of five little leaves. These little leaves are also part of the flower. Together they form what is called the calyx. The rest of the red part is called the corolla. Remember these words which are new to you. The corolla is the covered part of the flower the calyx is the circle of little leaves at the base of the corolla repeated jules most flowers have two envelopes like these one within the other the exterior or calyx is nearly always green the interior or corolla is embellished with those magnificent tints that please us in so many flowers in the mallow which you see here the calyx consists of five little green leaves and the corolla of five large pieces of lilac rose color. Each of these pieces is called a petal. The petals altogether make the corolla. The corolla of the digitalis has only one piece or a petal. That of the mallow has five, remarked Claire. It looks that way at first, but on examining closely, you will find that they both have five. I must tell you that in a great many flowers the petals unite as soon as they begin to form in the bud, and by their union constitute a corolla which looks like only one piece. But very often the united petals separate a little at the edge of the flower, and by indentations more or less deep, show how many are joined together. Look at this tobacco blossom. The corolla forms a tun-bellied funnel, apparently composed of only one piece but the edge of the flower is cut out in five similar parts, which are extremities of so many petals. The tobacco blossom then has five petals, the same as the mallow. Only these five petals, instead of being separate all their length, are welded together in a sort of funnel. Corollas with separate petals are called polypetalous corollas. Oh, like that of the mallow, suggested Claire. And that of the pear, almond, and strawberry, added Jules. Jules gets some very pretty ones, the pansy and the violet, said Emile. Corollas with petals all joined together are called monopetalous corollas, continued Uncle Paul. For example, digitalis and tobacco, said Jules. And the bell flowers, don't forget about them. The beautiful white bell flowers that climb the hedges, Emil added. The five petals joined together are just as easily distinguishable in this flower we have here, called snapdragon. Why is it called snapdragon? asked Emil. Because when it is pressed on both sides, it opens its mouth like an animal. Uncle Paul made the flower yawn. Under pressure of his fingers, it opened and shut its mouth 
as if biting. Emil looked on in amazement. In this mouth there are two lips, upper and lower. Well, the upper lip is split in two by a deep indentation, the sign of two petals, and the lower lip is split in three, indicating three petals. The corolla of the snapdragon, although apparently all in one piece, is therefore in reality composed of five petals welded together. There are then, said Claire, five petals in the mallow, pear, almond, digitalis, tobacco, and snapdragon, with the difference that the five petals are separate in the mallow, pear, and almond, and welded together in the digitalis, snapdragon, and tobacco. Five petals, either separate or united, Uncle Paul went on, are found in a great many other flowers. Let us come back to the calyx. The little green leaves of which it is composed are called sepals. There are five in the different flowers we have just examined. Five in the mallow, five in tobacco, five in digitalis, five in the snapdragon. Like the petals, the parts of the calyx, or sepals, sometimes remain separate, sometimes joined together, but generally leave some indentations showing their numbers. The calyx, having its parts distinct from one another, is called a polysepalous calyx. That of the digitalis and of the snapdragon is of this class. The calyx with sepals united is known as a monosepalous calyx, such as that of the tobacco blossom. By the five indentations at its edge, one can easily see that it is formed of five pieces joined together. The number five occurs again and again, observed Claire. A flower, my child, is beyond doubt a wonderful thing of beauty, but especially is it a masterpiece of wise construction. Everything about it is calculated according to fixed rules, everything arranged by number and measure. One of the most frequent arrangements is in sets of five. That is why we have just found five petals and five sepals in all the flowers examined this morning. Another grouping that often occurs is that in threes. It is found in bulb flowers, the tulip, lily, lily of the valley, etc. These flowers have no green covering or calyx. They have only a corolla composed of six petals, three in an inner circle, three in an outer. The calyx and the corolla are the flower's clothing, a double clothing having both the substantial material that guards from inclemency and the fine texture that charms the eye. The calyx, the outer garment, is of simple form, modest coloring, firm structure, suitable for withstanding bad weather. It has to protect the flower not yet open, to shield it from the sun, from cold and wet. Examine the bud of a rose or mallow. See with what minute precision the five sepals of the calyx are united to cover the rest. Not the slightest drop of water could penetrate the interior, so carefully are their edges joined together. There are flowers that close the calyx every evening as a safeguard against the cold. The corolla, or inner garment, unites elegance of form and richness of tint with fineness of texture. It is to the flower what wedding garments are to us. That is what especially captivates our eye, so that we commonly consider it the most essential part of the flower, while it is really only a simple ornamental accessory. Of the two garments, the calyx is the more necessary. Many flowers of severe taste know how to dispense with the pleasing part, the corolla. But they are very careful not to renounce the useful, the calyx, which in its simplest form is reduced to a tiny little leaf-like scale. Flowers without corolla remain unseen, and the plants that bear them seem to us to have no blossoms. It is a mistake. All trees and plants bloom. Even the willow, oak, poplar, pine, beech, wheat, and, and so many others whose blossoms I have never seen, asked Jules. Even the willow, oak, and all the others, their blossoms are extremely numerous, but as they are very small and have no corolla, they escape the inattentive eye. There is no exception. Every plant has its blossom. 
End of The Blossom Chapter 60 of the Storybook of Science This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson The Storybook of Science by Jean-Henri Fabre Translated by Florence Bicknell Fruit it would be knowing a person very little only to be aware of his wearing a garment of a certain material, a coat of such and such a cloth. One does not know a flower any better when one knows that it is clothed with a calyx and a corolla. What is under this covering? Let us examine together this gilly flower. It has a calyx of four sepals and a corolla of four yellow petals. I take away these eight pieces. What is left now is the essential part, that is to say, the thing without which the flower could not fill its role, and would be perfectly useless. Let us go carefully over this remaining part. You will find it well worth the trouble. First, there are six little white rods, each one surmounted by a bag full of yellow powder. These six pieces are called stamens. They are found in all flowers in greater or lesser number. The gilly flower has six, four longer ones arranged in pairs, and two shorter. The double bag that surmounts the stamen is called an anther. The dust contained in the anther is known as pollen. It is yellow in the gilly flower, lily, and most plants, ashy gray in the poppy. You have already told us, Jules interposed, how clouds of pollen raised by the wind in the woods are the cause of supposed showers of sulphur that frighten people so. I take away the six stamens. There remains a central body, swollen at the bottom, narrow at the top, and surmounted by a kind of head, wet with a sticky moisture. In its entirety, this central body takes the name of pistil. The swelling at the bottom is called an ovary and the sticky head that terminates it is a stigma. What big names for such little things! exclaimed Jules. Little, yes, but of unparalleled importance. These little things, my dear friend, give us our daily bread. Without the miraculous work of these little things, we should die of hunger. I will take care to remember their names, then. I, too, chimed in Emile. But you must go over them again. They are so hard to learn. Uncle Paul began again. Jules and Emile repeated after him. Stamen, anther, and pollen. Pistol, stigma, and ovary. With a penknife I divide the flower in two. The split ovary shows us what is inside. I see little seeds in regular rows in two compartments, observed Jules. Do you know what those hardly visible seeds are? Not yet. They are the future seeds of the plant. The ovary, then, is the part of the plant where the seeds form. At a certain time the flower withers, the petals wilt and fall. The calyx does the same, or remains to play the part of protector a while longer. The dried stamens break off. Only the ovary remains growing larger, ripening, and finally becoming the fruit. Every fruit, the pear, apple, apricot, peach, walnut, cherry, melon, strawberry, almond, chestnut, begin by being a little swelling of the pistil. All these excellent things that the plant furnishes for food were first ovaries. A pear began by being the ovary of a pear blossom? Yes, my child. Pears, apples, cherries, apricots begin by being the ovaries of the respective flowers. I will show you an apricot in its blossom. Uncle Paul took an apricot blossom, opened it with his penknife, and showed the children what is here shown in the picture. In the heart of the flower you see the pistil surrounded by numerous stamens. The head that terminates at the top is the stigma. The swelling at the bottom is the ovary, or future apricot. 
That little green thing would have been an apricot, full of sweet juice that I like so much, inquired Emile. That little green thing would have become an apricot like those Emile is so fond of. Now would you like to see the ovary that gives us bread? Oh, yes. All these things are very curious, replied Jules. Better than that, very important. Claire gave her uncle a needle at his request. Then, with the delicate patience necessary for this operation, he isolated one of the numerous flowers of which the whole forms the ear of wheat. The delicate little flower displayed clearly on the point of the needle the different parts composing it. The blessed plant that gives us bread has not time to think of its toilet. It has such weighty things to attend to. It must feed the world. So you see what quiet clothes it wears. Two poor scales serve it for calyx and corolla. You can easily recognize three hanging stamens with their double sachets for anthers. The principal body of the flower is the tun-bellied ovary, which, when ripe, will be a grain of wheat. It is surrounded by the stigma, fashioned like a double plume of exquisite delicacy. Salute it, my children. Behold the modest little flower that gives life to us all. End of Fruit Chapter 61 of the Storybook of Science This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson The Storybook of Science by Jean-Henri Fabre Translated by Florence Bicknell Pollen In a few days, even in a few hours, a flower withers. Pistols, stamens, calyx fade and die. Only one thing survives, the ovary, which will become fruit. Now in order to outlive the other parts of the flower and remain on its stem when all the rest dries up and falls, the ovary, at the moment when blossoming, is at its greatest vigor, receives a supplement of strength, I should almost say a new life. The magnificence of the corolla, its sumptuous colorings, its perfumes, serve to celebrate the solemn moment when this new vitality comes to the ovary. This great act accomplished, the flower has had its day. Well, it is the pollen, the, the yellow dust of the stamens, that gives this increase of energy without which the nascent seed would perish in the ovary itself withered. It falls from the stamens onto the stigma, always coated with a stickiness apt to hold it, and from the stigma it makes its mysterious action felt in the depths of the ovary. Animated with new life, the nascent seeds develop rapidly, while the ovary swells so as to give them necessary room. The final result of this incomprehensible travail is the fruit, with its contents of seeds ready to germinate and produce new plants. Do not question me further about these wonderful things concerning which even the keenest observer ceases to see clearly. God only, the wisest of beings, knows how a grain of pollen can give birth to something that was not before, and can cause the ovary to feel the stirring of the vital principle. I will tell you now how we know that the falling of the pollen onto the stigma is indispensable to the development of the ovary into fruit. Most flowers have both stamens and pistils. All those we have just looked at are in that class. But there are plants that have some flowers with stamens and others with pistils. Sometimes the flowers with stamens only and those with pistils only are found on the same plant. Sometimes they are found on separate plants. Did I not fear to overcharge your memory? I would tell you that plants having flowers with stamens only and flowers with pistils only on the same plant are called monoecious plants. This expression means living in one house. In a word, the flowers with stamens and those with pistils live together in the same house since they are found on the same plant. The pumpkin, cucumber, melon are monoecious plants. 
vegetables whose flowers with stamens and flowers with pistils are found on different plants are termed dioecious, that is to say plants with a double house. By this is meant that the ovary and pollen are not found in the same plant. The locust, date, and hemp are dioecious. The locust is a tree of extreme southern France. Its fruit grows in pods similar to those of the pea, but brown, very long, and plump. This fruit, in addition to seeds, has a sugary flesh. Supposing we took a notion, if the climate permitted, to grow locust seeds in our garden, what locust tree must we plant? Evidently the tree with pistils, because it alone possesses the ovaries which become fruit. But that is not enough. Planted by itself, the locust tree with pistils will be able to blossom abundantly every year without ever producing any fruit, for its flowers would fall without leaving a single ovary on the branches. What is wanting? The action of the pollen. Close to the locust with pistils, let us plant one with stamens. Now fructification proceeds as we wish. Wind and insects carry the pollen from the stamens to the stigmas. The torpid ovaries spring to life, and in time the locust pods grow and ripen perfectly. With pollen, fruit. Without pollen, no fruit. Are you convinced, Jules? Without doubt, uncle. Only, unfortunately, we do not know the locust. I should prefer a plant of our own region. I will tell you one that will permit you to prove what I have told you. But first of all, let me mention a second example. The date tree, like the locust, is dioecious. Arabs cultivate it for its fruit. Dates, their chief food. Dates are those long fruits of a very sweet taste, preserved in dry boxes, said Jules. A Turk was selling some at the last fair. The kernel is long and split along one side from one end to the other. That is it. In the country of the date tree, a sandy country burnt by the sun, spots of watered and fertile earth are rare. These spots are called oases. It is necessary to utilize them as much as possible. So the Arabs plant only date trees with pistols, the only ones that will produce dates. But when they are in flower, the Arabs go long distances to seek bunches of flowers with stamens on wild date trees, to shake the dust on the trees they have planted. Without this precaution, there is no harvest. Uncle will tell us so much, Emil interposed, that I shall have as much regard for the pollen as I have for the ovary. Without it, I should not have tasted the dates of the Turk who smoked such a long pipe. Without it, no apricots and, and no cherries. In the garden there is a long pumpkin vine that will soon blossom. I will give it to you for the following experiment. The pumpkin is monaceous. Flowers with the stamens and flowers with pistils inhabit the same house, the same plant. Before they are full-blown, they can easily be distinguished from each other. The flowers with pistils have under the corolla a swelling almost as large as a nut. This swelling is the ovary, the future pumpkin. The blossoms with stamens have not this swelling. Cut off all the blossoms with stamens before they are full-blown and leave those with pistils. For greater surety, wrap each one of these in a piece of gauze before it is in full bloom. The covering must be large enough to permit the flower to open. Do you know what will happen? Not being able to receive the pollen since the flowers with stamens are cut off, and since also the gauze wrapping keeps out the insects from the neighboring gardens, the pistillate flowers will wither after languishing a while, and the plant will not produce any pumpkins. Would you, on the contrary, like such and such blossoms at your choice to produce pumpkins in spite of their God's prison and the suppression of the staminate blossoms? With the tip of your finger, take a little pollen from one of the blossoms you have cut off and put the yellow dust on the stigma of a pistillate flower. Then replace the gauze wrapping. That is enough. The pumpkin will come. You will let us try that delightful experiment? 
asked Jules. I will. I give the pumpkin vine over to you. I have some gauze, volunteered Claire. And I some string to tie it with, added Emile. Come along, cried Jules. And gay as larks, the three children ran to the garden to get everything ready for the experiment. End of Pollen Chapter 62 of the Storybook of Science. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Storybook of Science by Jean Henry Fabre. Translated by Florence Bicknell. Chapter 62 The Bumblebee. The flowers with pollen were cut off those with ovaries wrapped each in a separate gauze bag. Every morning they went and watched the blossoming. With pollen taken from the cut flowers, they powdered the stigmas of four or five pistillant blossoms, and it happened just as their uncle had said. The ovaries whose stigmas had received the pollen became pumpkins. The others dried up without swelling. Now during these experiments, which were both a serious study and a joyful amusement, Uncle Paul continued his account of the flower. The pollen reaches the stigma in diverse ways. Sometimes the stamens, which are longer, let it fall by its own weight on the shorter pistil. Sometimes the wind, shaking the flower, deposits the dust of the stamens on the stigma or even carries it long distances for the benefit of other ovaries. There are flowers whose stamens behave in such a manner as to fulfill their mission. They bend over alternately and apply their antlers to the stigma, there to deposit some pollen, then slowly raise themselves to give place one to another. They might be regarded as a circle of courtiers, depositing their offerings at the feet of a great king. These salutations at an end, the roll of the stamens is finished. The flower fades, but the ovary begins to ripen its seeds. The Vallisnera is a plant that lives under water. It is very common in the southern canal. Its leaves resemble narrow green ribbons. It is dioecious, that is to say, it has flowers with stamens and those with pistils on different plants. The pistillant flowers are borne on long, tightly curled stems. The blossoms with stamens have only very short stems. Under water, where the current would carry away the pollen and prevent its fastening itself on the stigmas, the quickening action of the stamens on the pistil cannot take place. So the vallis nera, fixed by its roots in the mud, is obligated to send its flowers to the surface of the water to let them blossom in the open air. It is easy for the pistillant flowers. They unwind the curl that supports them and mount to the surface. But what will the staminate flowers do, fastened as they are to the bottom with their short stems? I cannot undertake to say, answered Jules. Well, by their own strength, without any external aid, these flowers pull away from their stems, break their moorings, and mount to the surface to rejoin the pistillant flowers. Then they open their little white corollas and free their pollen to wind and insects, which deposit it on the stigmas. After that they die and the current carries them away, while the flowers quickened by the pollen curl up again and descend once more beneath the water, there to ripen their ovaries at leisure. It is wonderful, uncle. One would say those little flowers know what they are doing. They do not know what they are doing. They obey mechanically the laws of providence, which makes sport of difficulties and knows how to accomplish miracles in a simple blade of grass. Would you like another striking example of this infinite wisdom that foresees everything, arranges everything? Let us come back to the snapdragon. Insects are the flower's auxiliaries. Flies, wasps, honeybees, bumblebees, beetles, butterflies, 
all vie with one another in rendering aid by carrying the pollen of the stamens to the stigmas they dive into the flower enticed by a honeyed drop expressly prepared at the bottom of the corolla in their efforts to obtain it they shake the stamens and daub themselves with pollen which they carry from one flower to another who has not seen bumblebees coming out of the blossom of the flowers all covered with pollen their hairy stomachs powdered with pollen have only to touch a stigma in passing to communicate life to it when in the spring you see on a blossoming pear tree a whole swarm of flies bees and butterflies hurrying humming and fluttering it is a triple feast my friends a feast for the insect that pilfers in the depth of the flowers a feast for the tree whose ovaries are quickened by all these merry little people and a feast for man to whom abundant harvest is promised the insect is the best distributor of pollen all the flowers it visits receives their share of quickening dust it is in order to prevent the insects coming from neighboring gardens and bringing pollen that you have had the pumpkin blossoms covered with bags of gauze inquired emil yes my child without this precaution the pumpkin experiment would certainly not succeed for insects come from a distance very far perhaps and deposit on our flowers the pollen gathered from other pumpkins and very little of it is necessary a few grains are enough to give life to an ovary to attract the insect that it needs every flower has at the bottom of its corolla a drop of sweet liquor called nectar from this liquor bees make their honey to draw it from corollas shaped like a deep funnel butterflies have a long trumpet curled in a spiral when at rest but which they unroll and plunge into the flower like a boar when they wish to obtain the delicious drink the insect does not see this drop of nectar however it knows that it is there and finds it without hesitation but in some flowers a grave difficulty presents itself these flowers are closed tight everywhere how is the treasure to be got at how find the entrance that leads to the nectar well these closed flowers have a signboard a mark that says clearly enter here you won't make us believe that cried claire i am not going to make you believe anything my dear child i am going to show you look at this snapdragon blossom it is shut tight its two closed lips leave no passage between its color is a uniform purplish red but there just in the middle of the lower lip is a large spot of bright yellow this spot so appropriate for catching the eye is the mark the signboard i told you of by its brightness it says here is the keyhole press your little finger on the spot you see the flower yawns immediately the secret lock works and you think the bumblebee does not know these things watch it in the garden and you will see how it can read the signs of the flowers when it visits a snapdragon it always alights on the yellow spot and nowhere else the door opens it enters it twists and turns in the corolla and covers itself with pollen with which it dabs the stigma having drunk the drop it goes off to other flowers forcing the opening of which it knows the secret thoroughly all closed flowers have like the snapdragon a conspicuous point a spot of bright color a sign that shows the insect the entrance to the corolla and says to it here it is finally insects whose trade it is to visit flowers and make the pollen fall from the stamens onto the stigma have a wonderful knowledge of the significance of this spot it is on it they use their strength to make the flower open let us recapulate insects are necessary to flowers to bring pollen to the stigmas a drop of nectar distilled on purpose for this attracts them to the bottom of the corolla a bright spot shows them the road to follow either i am a triple idiot or we have here an admirable chain of facts later my children you will find only too many people saying this world is the product of chance 
No intelligence rules it. No providence guides it. To those people, my friends, show the snapdragon's yellow spot. If less clearly sighted than the burly bumblebee, they do not understand it. Pity them. They have diseased brains. End of chapter 62 Recording by Sharon Kilmer, Rio Medina, Texas Chapter 63 of the Storybook of Science This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Velwest The Storybook of Science by Jean-Henri Favre Translated by Florence Bicknell Chapter 63 Mushrooms while they were talking about insects and flowers, time had slipped by until the Sunday arrived when Uncle Paul was to tell about mushrooms. The gathering was larger than the first time. The story of poisonous plants had been repeated in the village. Some people, in a rut, content with their stupid ignorance, had said, "'What is the use of it?' "'The use,' replied the others, it teaches one to beware of poisonous plants so as not to die miserably like poor Joseph. But those in the rut had tossed their heads with a satisfied air. Nothing is so sufficient unto itself as folly. So only willing listeners came to Uncle Paul. Of all the poisonous plants, my friends, he began, mushrooms are the most formidable. And yet some furnish a delightful food capable of tempting the soberest. For my part, observed Simon, I acknowledge nothing is equal to a dish of mushrooms. Nobody will accuse you of gluttony, for, as I have just said, mushrooms can tempt the soberest. I do not wish to discourage their use. I know too well what a resource they are in the country. I simply propose to put you on your guard against the poisonous kinds. You're going to teach us to distinguish the good from the bad? asked Matthew. No, that is impossible for us. Well, how impossible? Everybody knows that you can eat without fear mushrooms that grow at the foot of such and such a tree. Before answering that remark, I will address myself to you all and ask, Have you confidence in my word? Do you think that passing one's life in studying such things is more instructive than the hearsay of those who do not concern themselves with these matters? You may speak, Maitre Paul. We all have full confidence in your learning, Simon made answer for the company. Well, then, I repeat it in all conviction. It is impossible for us who are not specialists to distinguish an edible mushroom from a poisonous one. For none has a mark to say, this is edible and this is not. Neither the nature of the ground, nor the trees at the foot of which they grow, nor their form, color, taste, smell, can teach us anything or enable us to distinguish at sight the harmless from the poisonous. I admit that a person who had passed long years studying mushrooms with the minute attention of a scientist, would succeed in distinguishing pretty well the poisonous from the harmless, just as one acquires a knowledge of any other plant. But can we undertake such studies? Have we the time? We scarcely know a dozen weeds, and yet we would presume to pass judgment on the properties of mushrooms, so many in kind and resembling one another so closely." I hasten to add that, in every locality, actual use has long since taught the people some kinds that they can eat without danger. It is a good thing to conform to this usage, which makes us profit by other people's experience. On condition, be it understood, that we acquaint ourselves with the kinds used. But that is not enough to keep us safe from all peril. It is so easy to make a mistake. And then, Go to another place, and you will come across other mushrooms which, while apparently of the same family as those you have known as edible, 
will be dangerous. My rule of conduct is, you see, absolute. You must beware of all mushrooms. Excess of prudence is necessary here. I admit with you, said Simon, that it is impossible for us to distinguish at sight the edible from the poisonous kinds, but there are ways of deciding the question. Tell us how. In the autumn, we cut mushrooms in slices and dry them in the sun. They are excellent food for winter. The poisonous mushrooms rot without drying. The good ones keep. Wrong. All mushrooms, good or bad, indifferently, keep or spoil according to their more or less advanced state and according to the weather at the time of preparation. This characteristic is of no value whatever. Worms attack good mushrooms, Antoine here interposed. They do not attack bad ones because they poison them. That characteristic is no better than the other one. Worms attack all old mushrooms, bad as well as good, for what would be death to us is harmless to them. Their stomach is made so that they can eat poison with impunity. Certain insects eat aconite, digitalis, belladonna. They feast on what would kill us. They say, remarked Jean, that a piece of silver put in the pot when the mushrooms are cooking turns black if they are poisonous and remains white if they are good. The saying is a foolish one, and to put it into practice, a folly. Silver does not change color any more from bad than from good mushrooms. There is nothing to do, then, but give up mushrooms. That would be hard on me, said Simon. No, no, I promise you, on the contrary, that you will be able to use them more than you have done. The only thing is to proceed advisedly. What is poisonous in mushrooms is not the flesh, but the juice with which it is impregnated. Get rid of that juice, and the injurious properties will disappear immediately. This is accomplished by slicing and cooking the mushrooms, either dried or fresh, in boiling water with a handful of salt. They are then drained in a colander and washed two or three times in cold water. That done, they are prepared in any way one chooses. If, on the contrary, mushrooms are prepared without having first been cooked in boiling water, we expose ourselves to the danger of a poisonous juice. The cooking in boiling water to which salt has been added is so efficacious that, in order to solve this serious problem, certain persons have had the courage to eat for whole months the most poisonous mushrooms, prepared, however, in the way I have just told you. And what happened to them? asked Simon. Nothing at all. It is true that these persons prepared their poisonous mushrooms with the most scrupulous care. There was a reason for it. According to you, then, one could use all mushrooms without distinction? Strictly speaking, yes. But that would be going too far, much too far. There would be the fear of incomplete preparation, insufficient cooking. I only affirm that you must submit mushrooms of good repute in the neighborhood to the preliminary cooking in boiling water. If, by chance, some poisonous ones were included, the poison would in this way be eliminated, and no accident would happen. I would bet my hand on that. What you have just taught us, Maitre Paul, will be profited by, you may be sure. Are we ever quite certain that there is nothing poisonous in what we gather? Before saying goodbye, Simon approached Mother Amboisine and entered with her into more circumstantial details of the cooking. He is so fond of mushrooms, the worthy man. End of Chapter 63 Mushrooms Recording by Linda Velwest Chapter 64 of The Storybook of Science. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jill Ingle. The Storybook of Science by Jean Henri Fabre. Translated by Florence Bicknell. In the Woods. The history of mushrooms reduced to a rule for cooking which will save us from grave dangers was enough for Simon, Matthew, Jean, and the others, who lacked time to hear more. But Emile, Jules, and Claire were not satisfied. They wished to extend their knowledge on these strange vegetables. So their uncle took them one day to a beech wood near the village. The trees, several hundred years old, and with their branches meeting at a great height, formed an arch of foliage through which, here and there, shone a ray of sunlight. Their smooth trunks, with white bark, gave the effect of enormous columns sustaining the weight of an immense building, full of shade and silence. On the lofty summits crows cawed while smoothing their feathers. Occasionally a red-headed green woodpecker, surprised at its work, which consists of pecking the wormy wood with its beak to make the insects come out that it feeds on, gave a cry of alarm and flew off like a dart. In the midst of the moss with which the ground was carpeted were here and there numbers of mushrooms. Some were round, smooth, and white. Jules could not admire them enough. He likened them in his imagination to eggs laid in a mossy hollow by some wandering hen. Others were glossy red, others bright fawn color, and still others brilliant yellow. Some, just coming out of the ground, were enveloped in a kind of bag that tears open as the mushroom grows. Some, more advanced, spread out like an open umbrella. Finally, there were many that had already begun to decay. In their fetid rottenness swarmed innumerable grubs, which later would become insects. After picking a number of the principal kinds, the party sat down at the foot of a beach, on the soft moss carpet, and Uncle Paul spoke thus. A mushroom is the blossom of a plant that lives underground, and is called by learned men mycelium. This subterranean plant is composed of white, slender, fragile threads, resembling in their entirety a large cobweb. If you pull up a mushroom carefully, you will see at the base of its stalk, in the earth that clings to it, numerous white threads of the mycelium. Let us imagine a rose bush planted so as to leave nothing but the roses above ground. The buried bush will represent the subterranean mycelium. The roses open to the air will represent the blossoms of the mycelium, that is to say, the mushrooms. A rose bush, objected Jules, has stout branches covered with leaves. The mushroom plant, according to what I see, has nothing of the sort. It is a kind of moldiness that branches out in the ground in white veins. Those white veins, so delicate that one can hardly touch them without breaking them, form the subterranean plant without leaves or roots. They lengthen little by little in the ground to a pretty good distance from the point of departure. Then, at a favorable moment, they produce little swellings which grow underground become mushrooms, and burst open their bed of earth to expand in the air. This structure explains to us why mushrooms grow in groups. Each group, with the mycelium that produces it, constitutes one and the same plant. I have seen groups of mushrooms in a perfect circle, Claire remarked. If the ground is of uniform character and nowhere hinders the propagation of the subterranean vegetable in one direction rather than in another, the mycelium spreads equally on all sides, and so produces circular groups of mushrooms, which the country people sometimes call witches' circles. Why witches' circles? asked Jules. The ignorant and superstitious think they see an effect of witchcraft in this curious circular arrangement, whereas it is but the natural result of the uniformly equal development of the subterranean plant. Then there are no witches? said Emile. No, my dear. There are rogues who abuse the credulity of others. There are simpletons disposed to listen to them. But no one has preternatural powers. Since a mushroom is the blossom of a subterranean plant, of the mycelium, as you call it, 
must it not have stamens pistols ovaries jules inquired a mushroom is in its way the blossom of a kind of vegetable but its structure has nothing in common with that of ordinary flowers it is a structure of a special sort very complicated very curious which i shall pass by in silence so as not to overcharge your memory the chief function of a flower you know is to produce seeds well the mushroom too produces seeds but so small so different from others that they have a special name spores spores are the seed of the mushroom just as acorns are the seed of the oak that is worthy of some further explanation the mushrooms most familiar to us are composed of a sort of dome supported by a stalk this dome is called a cap the under side of the cap takes various shapes of which the principal are these sometimes it is composed of gills which radiate from the center to the border sometimes it is pierced by an infinity of little holes which are the orifices of as many tubes joined together in a common mass sometimes it is covered with fine points like those of a cat's tongue mushrooms that have the under side of the cap formed of radiating gills are called agarics those pierced with little holes boletae those covered with little points hydni agarics and boletae are the most common here uncle paul took one by one the mushrooms they had gathered and showed his nephews the gills of the agarics the holes of the boletai, and the points of the hydney. End of In the Woods Recording by Jill Ingle Chapter 65 of The Storybook of Science This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Linda Velwest The Storybook of Science by Jean-Henri Fabre Translated by Florence Bicknell Chapter 65 The Orange Agaric Mushroom seeds or spores form on these gills, these points, and on the walls of the tubes of which these holes are the orifices. I recommend to Jules the following experiment. We will take some mushrooms whose caps are not yet thoroughly spread. We will place them this evening on a sheet of white paper. During the night the blossoming will be finished, and the ripe seeds will fall from the gills of the agarix and the tubes of the bolitae. Tomorrow morning we shall find on the paper an impalpable dust, red, rose, brown, according to the kind of mushroom. This dust is nothing but a mass of seeds, of spores so fine that they cannot be seen separately without a microscope, so numerous they cannot be counted. There are millions and millions of them. A microscope, interrupted Emile, is that the instrument with which you sometimes look at things so small that the naked eye can scarcely see them? Yes. A microscope enlarges the objects seen through it and shows them to us in all their details of structure, although they would be hidden from the unaided eye by their smallness. Will you show us through the microscope the mushroom spores when I have collected them on a sheet of paper? asked Jules. I will show them to you. One spore is enough, under favorable conditions of heat and moisture, to germinate and develop into white filaments, or mycelium, from which will spring at the right time numerous mushrooms. How many mushrooms would be produced if all the spores that fell by myriads and myriads from the gills of a single agaric were to germinate? Here again we have the story of the cod, the louse, all the feeble creatures, in short, that reproduce their kind in such immense numbers. To have mushrooms, then, as many as we want, it is only necessary to sow the spores? Jules again inquired. In that you are mistaken, my dear child. Up to this time, mushroom culture has been impossible, 
because the care required by their excessively delicate seeds is not understood by us, or may even be beyond our power. Only one edible mushroom is cultivated, and even in growing this we use not the spores, but the mycelium. They call it the hotbed mushroom. It is an agaric, satiny white above and pale rose beneath. In the old stone quarries near Paris they make beds of horse manure and light earth. In these beds they put pieces of mycelium, known to horticulturists under the name of mushroom spawn. This spawn ramifies, pushes out numerous filaments, and from these finally spring the mushrooms. Good to eat? Excellent. Among the mushrooms we gathered are those that I am going to acquaint you with. Look at this, first of all. It is an agaric. The upper surface of the cap is a beautiful orange-red. The gills underneath are yellow. The stalk rises from the bottom of a sort of white bag with torn edges. This bag, called vulva, at first enveloped the whole mushroom. In growing and pushing above ground, the cap broke it. This kind, they say, is the best of all, the most appreciated. It is called the orange agaric. This other agaric, likewise orange-red, and also provided with a bag or vulva at the base of the stalk, is called the false orange agaric. Would you not, however, think it was the same kind? I don't see much of a difference for my part, responded Claire. Nor I either, said Emile. I see a difference, Jules declared, but it is very slight. The second agaric has white gills, while the first has yellow. Jules has sharp eyes. I will add that in the false orange agaric, the upper surface of the cap is sewn with shreds of white skin, debris of the torn vulva. The other one has not these shreds, or very few. If one did not pay attention to these slight differences, one would commit a very fatal error. The first mushroom is a delicious viand. The second, or false orange agaric, is a deadly poison. I am no longer surprised, said Jules, at your telling Simon that it is impossible for us, without long study, to distinguish the good from the bad kinds. Here are two mushrooms almost as much alike as two drops of water. One kills, the other is excellent. Not a year passes without its lamentable cases of poisoning, from a confusion of the two kinds. Remember carefully their characteristics, so as not to expose yourself some day to a terrible mistake. I will be very careful not to forget them, Jules promised. Both orange agarics are orange-red and have a white vulva or bag. The edible orange agaric has yellow gills, the poisonous one white gills. Besides, added Emile, the poisonous orange agaric has numerous shreds of white skin on the cap. Look at this other that I picked from the trunk of a tree. It is a large, dark red boletus. It has no stalk. It fastens itself to old trunks by one of its sides. It is called the tinder agaric boletus because its flesh, cut in thin slices, dried in the sun, and made flexible by hammering, makes tinder. I did not dream that tinder came from a mushroom said Jules. The truffle is the most important of edible mushrooms. It grows underground, like the mycelium that produces it. Its odor betrays its presence. A very keen-scented animal, the pig, is led into the wood. Enticed by the smell of the subterranean mushroom, the pig roots with its snout at the spots where the truffles are hidden. Then the pig is driven away, but to console him they throw him a chestnut, and finally the precious mushroom is dug up. In its shape the truffle bears no resemblance to ordinary mushrooms. It has a bulky, round body, wrinkled, and black flesh, 
marbled with white. End of chapter 65 The Orange Agaric Recording by Linda Velwest Chapter 66 of The Storybook of Science This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Velwest The Story Book of Science by Jean-Henri Fabre Translated by Florence Bicknell Chapter 66 Earthquakes Early in the morning, all the neighbors were talking from door to door on the same subject. It seemed they had had a narrow escape during the night. Jacques said that at about two o'clock he had been awakened by the bellowing of his cattle, repeated two or three times. Even Azor himself, the good Azor, so peaceful in his stall when there was nothing serious to disturb him, had bellowed mournfully. Jacques had risen and lighted his lantern, but had been unable to discover what caused the trouble with the animals. Mother Amboisine, who slept with one eye open, told a longer tale. She had heard the dishes rattling on the kitchen dresser. Some plates had even rolled off and broken in falling to the ground. Mother Amboisine was thinking it was perhaps some misdeed of the cats when it seemed to her that strong arms seized the bed and shook it twice from head to foot and from foot to head. It was over in the twinkling of an eye. The worthy woman was so frightened that, throwing the covers over her head, she commended her soul to God. Matthew and his son were away at the time. They were returning home from the fair and were making the journey by night. The weather was fine, no wind, and bright moonlight. They were chatting about their affairs when a dull, deep noise was heard, coming from under the ground. It sounded like the roar of the big mill dam. At the same moment, they staggered as if the ground had been giving way under them. Then nothing more. The moon continued to shine. The night was calm and serene. It was so soon over that Matthew and his son wondered whether they had not dreamed it. These were among the more serious incidents related. Meanwhile, there was passing from mouth to mouth, moving some to incredulous smiles and others to grave reflections, the terrible word, earthquake. In the evening, Uncle Paul was surrounded by his auditors, eager for some explanation of the great news of the day. "'Is it true, Uncle,' asked Jules, "'that the earth sometimes trembles?' "'Nothing is truer, my dear child. "'Sometimes here, sometimes elsewhere, "'suddenly there is a movement of the ground. "'In our privileged countries we are far from having any exact idea "'of these terrible agitations of the earth. "'If once in a while a slight trembling is felt, "'it is talked of for days as a curiosity. "'Then it is forgotten.' Many tell today of the events of the past night without attaching much importance to them, not knowing that the force revealed to us by a light movement of the earth can, in its brutal power, bring about frightful disasters. Jacques has told you of the bellowing of the cattle, an Azor's outcry. Mother Amboisine has described to you her fright when her bed was shaken twice. In all that, there is nothing very terrifying but earthquakes are not always harmless. Alas, no. And may God preserve us from ever undergoing this sad experience. Is an earthquake then very serious? Jules again inquired. For my part, I thought it only meant a few plates broken and some furniture displaced. It seems to me, said Claire, that if the movement were strong enough, houses would fall down. But Uncle is going to tell us about a violent earthquake. Earthquakes are often preceded by subterranean noises, a dull rumbling that swells, abates, swells again, as if a storm were bursting in the depths of the earth. At this rumbling, full of menacing mysteries, every creature becomes quiet, 
mute with fear, and everyone turns pale. Warned by instinct, animals are struck with stupor. Suddenly, the earth shivers, bulges up, subsides again, whirls, cracks open, and discloses a yawning gulf. Oh, my goodness, Claire exclaimed. And what becomes of the people? You will see what becomes of them in these terrible catastrophes. Of all the earthquakes felt in Europe, the most terrible was that which ravaged Lisbon in 1775 on All Saints Day. No danger appeared to menace the festal town when suddenly there burst from underground a rumbling like continuous thunder. Like continuous thunder. Then the ground, then the ground, shaken violently several times, rose up, sank down, and in a moment the populous capital of Portugal was nothing but a heap of ruins and dead bodies. The people that were still left, seeking refuge from the fall of the ruins, had retired to a large quay on the seashore. All at once the quay was swallowed up in the waters, dragging with it the crowd and the boats and ships moored there. Not a victim, not a piece of wreck came back to float on the surface. An abyss had opened, swallowing up waters, quay, ships, people, and, closing up again, kept them forever. In six minutes, 60,000 persons perished. While that was happening at Lisbon, and the high mountains of Portugal were shaking on their bases, several towns of Africa, Morocco, Fez, Mequinez, were overthrown. A village of 10,000 souls was swallowed up with its entire population in an abyss suddenly opened and suddenly closed. Never, uncle, have I heard of such terrible things, declared Jules. And I laughed, said Emile, when Mother Ambroisine told us of her fright. It was nothing to laugh at. If it had been God's will, our village might last night have disappeared from the earth with us all, as did that one in Africa. Listen to this, too, Uncle Paul continued. In February 1783, in southern Italy, convulsions began that lasted four years. During the first year alone, 949 were counted. The surface of the ground was wrinkled in moving waves like the surface of a stormy sea, and on this unstable ground people felt nauseated as if on the deck of a vessel. Sea sickness reigned on land. At every undulation, the clouds, really immobile, seemed to move brusquely, just as they do at sea when we are on a vessel tossed by the wind. Trees bowed in the terrestrial wave and swept the earth with their tops. In two minutes, the first shock overthrew the greater part of towns, villages, and small boroughs of southern Italy, as well as of Sicily. The whole surface of the country was thrown into confusion. In several places, the ground was creviced with fissures, resembling on a large scale the cracks in a pane of broken glass. Vast tracts of ground with their cultivated fields, their dwellings, vines, olive trees— slid down the mountainsides and went considerable distances to settle finally on other sites. Here, hills split in two. There, they were torn from their places and transported to some other part. Elsewhere, there was nothing to uphold the ground, and it was engulfed in yawning abysses, taking with it dwellings, trees, and animals, which were never seen again. In still other places, deep funnels full of moving sand opened, forming presently vast cavities that were soon converted into lakes by the inrush of subterranean waters. It is estimated that more than 200 lakes, ponds, and marshes were thus suddenly produced. In certain places, the ground, softened by waters turned from their channels or brought from the interior to the crevices, was converted into torrents of mud that covered the plains or filled the valleys, the tops of trees and the roofs of ruined farm buildings were the only things to be seen above this sea of mud. At intervals, sudden quakes shook the ground to a great depth. The shocks were so violent that street pavements were torn from their beds and leaped into the air. 
The masonry of wells flew out from below the surface in one piece like a small tower thrown up from the earth. When the ground rose and split open, houses, people, and animals were instantly swallowed up, then the ground subsiding again, the crevice closed once more, and without leaving a vestige, everything disappeared, crushed between the two walls of the abyss as they drew together. Sometime afterward, when, after the disaster, excavations were made in order to recover valuable lost objects, the workmen observed that the buried buildings and all that they contained were one compact mass. So violent had been the pressure of this sort of vice formed by the two edges of the closed-up crevice. The number of persons who perished in these terrible circumstances is estimated at 80,000. Most of these victims were buried alive under the ruins of their houses. Others were consumed by fires that sprang up in these ruins after each shock. Others, fleeing across the country, were swallowed up in the abysses that opened under their feet. The sight of such calamities ought to have awakened pity in the hearts of barbarians. And yet, who would believe it? Except for a very few acts of heroism, the conduct of the people was most infamous. The Calabrian peasants ran to the towns not to give help, but to pillage. Without any concern about the danger, they traversed the streets in the midst of burning walls and clouds of dust, kicking and robbing the victims even before the breath had left their bodies. Miserable creatures, cried Jules. Horrid rascals, ah, if I had only been there. If you had been there, what would you have done, my poor child? There were plenty there with as good hearts and better fists than yours, but they could do nothing. Are those Calabrians very wicked? asked Emile. Wherever education has not been introduced, there are brutal natures that in time of trouble spring up. No one knows whence, and frighten the world with their atrocities. Another story will teach you more of the Calabrian peasants. End of chapter 66 Recording by Linda Velwest Chapter 67 of the Story Book of Science. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. The Story Book of Science by Jean Henri Fabre. Translated by Florence Bicknell. Chapter 67 shall we kill them both uncle paul went up to his room and came back with a book what i am going to read to you is from a mounted artillery man more expert in the art of the pen than in that of the cannon at the beginning of the century a french army occupied calabria our gunner belonged to it here is a letter he wrote to his cousin one day i was traveling in calabria it is a country of bad people who love no one and have a special spite against the french it would take too long to tell you why enough that they mortally hate us and one is sure of a bad time if one falls into their hands my companion was a young man in these mountains the roads are precipices our horses could hardly climb them my comrade was in front a path that seemed to him shorter and more practicable misled us it was my fault ought I to have my trust in a man of twenty years? As long as daylight lasted, we tried to find our way through the woods. But the more we tried, the more bewildered we got, and it was pitch dark when we reached a dimly lighted house. We entered, not without suspicion, but what could we do? And there we found a charcoal burner and all his family at table, to which they immediately invited us. My young man needed no urging. We sat down, eating and drinking, or he at least, for I busied myself examining the place and the countenances of our hosts. They had the appearance of charcoal burners, but the house might have been taken for an arsenal. It was full of guns, pistols, sabers, knives, cutlasses. It all displeased me, and I saw well that I, on my part, was equally displeasing to our entertainers. My comrade, on the contrary, made himself one of the family. 
He laughed, chaffed with them, and, with an imprudence that I ought to have foreseen, told them at the very first whence we came, whither we were going, who we were. Frenchmen, imagine it, amongst our most mortal enemies, alone, lost, far from all human aid. And then, to add to our probable ruin, he acted the rich man, promising these people whatever they wished, in payment, and for the hire of guides on the morrow. Finally, he spoke of his valise, begging them to be very careful of it, and to put it at the head of his bed. He said he did not wish any other bolster. Ah, youth, youth, how your immaturity is to be pitied. Cousin, you would have thought we were carrying the crown diamonds. That young man was certainly very imprudent, commented Jules. Could he not hold his tongue, seeing he was in the hands of wicked people? Silence is very difficult for giddy, careless young persons. I will go on. Supper finished, they left us. Our hosts slept below, we in the upper room, where we had eaten. A loft seven or eight feet high, reached by a ladder, was the bed that awaited us, a kind of nest that one got into by crawling under joists, laden with provisions for a year. My comrade climbed up alone, and was soon asleep, his head on the precious valise. I determined to watch, so made a good fire, and sat down by it. The night had almost passed, quietly enough, and I began to feel reassured, when, just as it seemed to me, it must be near daylight, I heard our host and his wife quarrelling immediately under me, and, putting my ear close to the fireplace that communicated with the one below, I distinguished perfectly this proposal of the husband. Well, now, let us see. Shall we kill them both? To which the woman answered, Yes, and I heard nothing more. What can I say? I remain scarcely breathing, my body cold as marble. God, when I think of it, we too, all but unarmed against these twelve or fifteen with so many weapons, and my comrade dead with sleep and fatigue. To make a noise by calling him, I dared not. To escape by myself, I could not. The window was not far from the ground, but beneath it two big dogs were howling like wolves. Poor gunner! Emil exclaimed and his comrade sleeping like a simpleton, Claire added. At the end of a quarter of an hour, which seemed long, I heard someone on the stairs, and through the cracks of the door I saw the father, a lamp in one hand, and one of his long knives in the other. He was coming up, his wife following him. I placed myself behind the door as he opened it, put down the lamp, and his wife came and took it. Then he entered barefoot. From outside she said to him in a low tone, shading the lamp with her hand. Gently, go gently. When he came to the ladder, he mounted, knife between his teeth, and reaching the height of the bed on which lay this poor young man, his throat uncovered, with one hand he grasped his knife, and with the other, Ah, cousin! Enough, uncle! This story frightens me! cried Claire. Wait! And with the other, he seized the ham that was hanging from the ceiling, cut off a slice, and went off the way he had come. The door closed, the lamp disappeared, and I was left alone with my reflections. And then, inquired Jules, and then nothing more. As soon as it was daylight, continued the gunner, the whole family came and awakened us with much noise, as we had requested them. They brought food and served us a very good breakfast, I assure you. Two capons were part of it, one of which our hostess said we must eat, and take the other with us. On seeing them, I understood the significance of those terrible words. Shall we kill them both? The man and woman were discussing whether they should kill both capons, or only one for breakfast? asked Emil. That and nothing else, replied his uncle. All the same, the gunner had had a bad quarter of an hour for his mistake. Those charcoal burners were not at all such bad people as I thought at first, said Jules. That is the point I wish to make. Calabria like all countries, has its good and its bad people. End of chapter 67 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Chapter 68 of The Storybook of Science This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kevin Davidson. 
The Story Book of Science by Jean Henri Fabre, translated by Florence Bicknell. The Thermometer. The story of the gunner, Jules remarked, ended very differently from what one expected at the beginning. Just when one thinks the true travelers are done for, it turns out nothing more serious is in question than the roasting of two fowls. A shiver of fear seizes you when the man climbs a ladder with the cutlass between his teeth. The next minute you are laughing. That is a very amusing story, but it has turned us aside from the earthquakes. You have not told us yet the cause of these terrible movements of the ground. If that interests you, replied his uncle, let's talk about it a little. I will tell you first that the farther you descend into the earth, the hotter it becomes. Excavations made by man for obtaining various minerals give us valuable information on this subject. The deeper they go, the hotter it is. For every thirty meters of depth there is an increase of one degree in temperature. I don't know very well what a degree is, said Jules. And I don't know anything about it, confessed Emile. Let's begin with that. If not, it would be impossible for you to understand. In my room you have seen, on a little wooden board, a glass rod, pierced by a very fine canal, and ending at the bottom in a little bulb. In the bulb is a red liquid, which ascends or descends in the canal of a tube, according to whether it is warmer or colder. That is called a thermometer. In freezing water, the red liquid goes down to a point in the tube called zero. In boiling water, it goes up to a point marked 100. The distance between these two points is divided into 100 equal parts called degrees. Why degrees? asked Emile. By that, it is meant that these divisions have a certain resemblance to the degrees or steps of a flight of stairs or the rounds of a ladder. The red liquid goes up or down from division to division, just as we mount or descend a flight of stairs step by step. If it grows warmer, the red liquid moves and little by little climbs the steps. If colder, it goes down the ladder. Thus the heat can be estimated according to the step or degree where the liquid stops. It is freezing when the liquid goes down to zero. The heat is that of boiling water when it goes up to division 100. The intermediate steps, or degrees, indicate, evidently, other states of heat, greater when the degree is higher up on the ladder. The degree of heat of any body, as indicated by the thermometer, is called its temperature. We say the temperature of freezing water is zero, that of boiling water 100 degrees. One morning, said Emile, when you sent me to get something from your room, I put my hand on the bulb of the thermometer. The red liquid began to go up, little by little. It was the warmth of your hand that made it go up. I wanted to see how high the liquid would go, but I had not patience to wait till the end. I will tell you. At last the thermometer would have marked at most thirty-eight degrees, which is the temperature of the human body. "'And in the very hot days of summer, what degree does the thermometer mark?' asked Jules. "'In our region, the greatest heat of summer is from twenty-five to thirty-five degrees.' "'And in the hottest countries of the world?' Claire inquired. "'In the hottest countries, Senegal, for example, the temperature rises to forty-five and fifty degrees. It is twice as hot as our summer.' End of The Thermometer Recording by Kevin Davidson, www.bloggerdie.com Chapter 69 of the Story Book of Science. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kevin Davidson. The Storybook of Science by Jean-Henri Fabre, translated by Florence Bicknell. The Subterranean Furnace Let us get back to our subject. At the bottom of mines, I told you, a high temperature prevails, which keeps up during the whole year. There is always the same heat, winter and summer. 
The deepest excavation miners have ever made is in Bohemia. It is inaccessible today. Landslides have partly filled it. At the depth of 1,151 meters, the thermometer indicated a perpetual heat of 40 degrees, almost the temperature of the hottest regions in the world, and that, mind you, in winter as well as summer. When mountainous Bohemia was covered with ice and snow, it was only necessary to go down to the bottom of the mine to pass from the rigors of winter to the insupportable heat of a Senegal summer. One shivered with cold at the entrance and stifled with heat at the bottom. The same conditions, without exception, prevail everywhere. The deeper one descends in the earth, the hotter one finds temperature. In deep mines the heat is such that the most unobservant workman is struck by it and wonders if he is not near some immense furnace. "'The interior of the earth is, then, really a stove?' queried Jules. "'Much more than a stove, as you will see. The name of artesian well is given to a cylindrical hole which, by means of strong iron bars fitted end to end, is made in the ground until some reservoir of subterranean water fed by the infiltrations of neighboring streams or lakes is reached the water that comes up from far underground as the result of such a boring reaches the surface at a temperature equal to that of those depths and thus we learn about the distribution of heat in the bowels of the earth one of the most remarkable of these wells is that of grenelle at paris it is five hundred and forty-seven meters deep, and the water in it is constantly at twenty-eight degrees, a temperature almost as high as that of the hottest summer days. The water of the artesian well of Mondorf, on the frontier of France and Luxembourg, comes from a far greater depth, seven hundred meters. Its temperature is thirty-five degrees. Artesian wells, of which there are at present a considerable number, illustrate the same principle as mines. For every thirty meters of depth, the heat increases one degree. Then by digging wells deep enough, we should at last come to boiling water? Certainly. The difficulty is to attain the desired depth. To reach the temperature of boiling water, it would be necessary to bore about three-quarters of a league, which is impossible. However, a number of natural springs are known which, as they come from the ground, possess a high temperature, sometimes reaching the boiling point. They are called thermal springs, which means hot springs. There prevails, then, at the depth from which they come, a heat sufficient to make them tepid, or even boiling hot. The most remarkable hot springs of France are those of chaud Aigu and Vic in Cantal. They are almost boiling. Do these springs make streams that are different from others? Steaming springs in which you can plunge an egg for a moment and take it out cooked. Then there are no little fish or crabs, said Emile. Certainly not, my dear. You understand that if they were, they would be cooked through and through. That is true. The little streams of boiling water in Auvergne are nothing in comparison with what are seen in Iceland, that large island situated at the extreme north of Europe and covered with snow the greater part of the year. It has numbers of springs throwing up hot water, called in that country geysers. The most powerful, or the great geyser, springs from a large basin situated on the top of a hill formed by the smooth white incrustations deposited by the foam of the water. The interior of this basin is funnel-shaped and terminates in tortuous conduits penetrating to unknown depths. Each eruption of this volcano of boiling water is announced by a trembling of the earth and dull noises like distant detonations of some subterranean artillery. Every moment the detonations become stronger, the earth trembles, and from the bottom of the crater the water rushes up in an impetuous torrent and fills the basin where, for a few moments, we have what looks like a boiler heated by some invisible furnace. In the midst of a whirlpool of steam, the water rises in a boiling flood. Suddenly the geyser musters all its force, there is a loud explosion, 
and a column of water six meters in diameter spouts upward to the height of sixty meters and falls again in steaming showers after having expanded in the shape of an immense sheaf crowned with white vapor this formidable outburst lasts only a few moments soon the liquid sheaf sinks the water in the basin retires to be swallowed up in the depths of the crater and is replaced by a column of steam furious and roaring which spouts upward with thunderous reverberations and in its indomitable force hurls aloft huge masses of rock that have fallen into the crater or breaks them into tiny bits the whole neighborhood is veiled in these dense eddies of steam finally calm is restored and the fury of the geyser abates but only to burst forth again later and repeat the same program that must be terrible and beautiful at the same time commented emile no doubt you look at this furious fountain from a long distance so as not to be struck on the back by boiling showers what you have just told us uncle said jules shows plainly that there is great heat underground in admitting as all these observations justify us in doing that the subterranean temperature increases with the depth one degree for every thirty meters it is estimated that at three kilometers or three-quarters of a league down the temperature must be that of boiling water that is to say one hundred degrees five leagues down the heat is that of red-hot iron at twelve leagues it is sufficient to melt all known substances at a greater depth the temperature apparently is still higher accordingly we are to imagine that the earth is formed of a globe of matter liquefied by fire and enveloped by a thin crust of solid material that is upborne by that central ocean of melted minerals you say said claire a thin crust of solid material and yet according to the calculations you have just mentioned the thickness of the solid material must be about twelve leagues under that would be the melted matter it seems to me twelve leagues make a good thickness and we have nothing to fear from the subterranean fire twelve leagues are very little in relation to the earth's dimensions the distance from the surface of the earth to its center is sixteen hundred leagues of this distance about twelve leagues belong to the thickness of the solid crust all the rest to the molten globe on a ball two meters in diameter the solid crust of the earth would be represented by a thickness of half a finger's breadth let us make a more simple comparison representing the earth by an egg well, the eggshell is the solid crust of the globe, its liquid content is the central mass in fusion, and we are separated from the immense subterranean furnace by only that thin shell, exclaimed Jules. That is not at all reassuring. I agree. It is not without a certain emotion that one hears for the first time what science tells us of these intimate details of the Earth's structure one cannot think without fear of those burning abysses that roll their waves of melted minerals a few leagues under our feet how can a covering relatively so light resist the fluctuations of the central liquid mass this fragile crust this shell of the globe will not some time melt become disjointed crumble or at least move the little it does move makes continents tremble and the ground crack open in frightful chasms ah interposed claire that is the cause of earthquakes the liquid that inside is stirred and the shell moves it seems to me jules remarked that this shell comparatively so thin ought to tremble oftener perhaps not a day passes without the solid crust of the earth experiencing some shock sometimes at one point sometimes at another beneath the bed of the seas as well as under the continents however disastrous earthquakes are very rare thanks to the intervention of volcanoes volcanic orifices are in fact veritable safety valves which put the interior of the globe in communication with the exterior by offering permanent vents to the subterranean vapors that tend to liberate themselves by overturning the earth they render earthquakes less frequent and less disastrous in volcanic countries every time the ground is shaken by strong shocks 
The earthquake ceases the moment the volcano begins to throw up its fumes and lava. I will remember, said Jules, your account of the eruption of Etna and the Catanian disaster. At first I only saw in volcanoes terrible mountains spreading devastation around them. Now I begin to see their great use, their necessity. Without their air holes, the earth would seldom be still. End of The Subterranean Furnace Recording by Kevin Davidson www.blogordie.com Chapter 70 of the Storybook of Science This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Storybook of Science by Jean-Marie Fabre Translated by Florence Bicknell Shells In Uncle Paul's room was a drawer full of shells of all sorts. One of his friends had collected them in his travels. Pleasant hours could be passed in looking at them. Their beautiful colors, their pleasing but sometimes odd shapes diverted the eye. Some were twisted like a spiral staircase, others widened out in large horns still others opened and closed like a snuff-box some were ornamented with radiating ribs knotty creases or plates laid one on another like the slates of a roof some bristled with points spines or jagged scales here were some smooth as eggs sometimes white sometimes spotted with red others near the rose-tinted opening had long points resembling wide-stretched fingers they came from all parts of the world this came from the land of the negroes that from the red sea others from china india japan Truly, many pleasant hours could be passed in examining them one by one, especially if Uncle Paul were to tell you about them. One day Uncle Paul gave his nephews this pleasure. He spread before them the riches of his drawer. Jews and Clare looked at them with amazement. Emil was never tired of putting the large shells to his ear and listening to the continual hoo-hoo-hoo that escapes from depths and seems to repeat the murmur of the sea. This one with the red and lace-like opening comes from India. It is called a helmet some are so large that two of them would be as much as emil could carry in some islands they are so abundant that they are used instead of stones and are burnt in kilns to make lime i would not burn them for lime said jules if i found such beautiful shells see how red the opening is how beautifully the edges are pleated and then what a loud murmur it makes said emil is it true uncle that it is the noise of the sea echoed by the shell i do not deny that it resembles a little the murmur of waves heard at a distance but you must not think that the shell keeps in its folds an echo of the noise of the waves it is simply the effect of the air going and coming through the tortuous cavities. This other belongs to France. It is common on the shores of the Mediterranean and belongs to the genus Cassis. It goes 
hoo, hoo, like the helmet, Emil remarked, and all those that are rather large and have a spiral cavity do the same. Here is another which, like the preceding, is found in the Mediterranean. It is the spiny mollusk. The creature that inhabits it produces a violet glare, which the ancients derived for their costly stuffs, a magnificent color called purple. How are shells made? asked Claire. Shells are the dwellings of creatures called mollusks, the same as the spiral snail shells in the house of the horny little animal that eats your young flowering plants. Then the snail's house is a shell, the same as the beautiful ones you have shown us, Jews observed. Yes, my child. It is in the sea that we find in greatest number the largest and most beautiful shells. They are called sea shells. To these belong the helmet shells, cassidula, and spiny mollusks. But fresh waters, that is to say streams, rivers, ponds, lakes, have them too. The smallest ditch in our country has shells of good shape, but somber, earthy in color. They are called freshwater shells. I have seen some in the water resembling large pointed spiral snails, said Jules. They have a sort of cap to close the opening. They are paludinii. I remember another ditch cell, said Claire. It is round, flat, and as large as a ten or even twenty sous piece. That is one of the planorbidae. Finally, there are shells that are always found on land, and for that reason are called land shells. Such is the spiral snail. I have seen very pretty snails, Jews remarked, almost as pretty as the shells in this drawer. In the woods you see yellow ones with several black bands wound round them in regular order. The creature we call the spiral snail. Isn't it a slug that finds an empty shell and lives in it? asked Emil. No, my friend. A slug remains always a slug without becoming a snail. That is to say, it never has a shell. The snail, on the contrary, is born with a tiny shell that grows little by little as the snail grows. The empty shells you find in the country have had their inhabitants, which are now dead, and turn to dust, only their houses remaining. A slug and a snail without its shell are very much alike. Both are mollusks. There are mollusks that do not make shells, the slug, for example. Others that do make them, such as the snails, the paludididae, and the cassididae. And of what does the snail make its house? of its own substance, my little friend. It sweats the materials for its house. I don't understand. Don't you make your teeth so white, shiny, and all in a row? From time to time a new one pushes through without you giving it any thought. It does it by itself. These beautiful teeth are a very hard stone. Where does that stone come from? From your own substance, it is clear. Our gum sweats stone which fashions itself into teeth. So the snail's house is built. The little creature sweats the stone that shapes itself into a graceful shell. But to arrange stones one on another and make houses of them, you need masons. The snail's house is made without masons. When I say it is done by itself, I do not mean that the stone has the faculty of making itself into a shell. 
You never see rubble piling itself unaided into a wall. God, the Father of all things, willed that the stone should arrange itself into a mother-of-pearl palace to serve as a dwelling for the poor animal, brother to the slug, and it is accomplished according to his will. In like manner he told the stone to grow up into beautiful teeth from the depths of the rosy gums of little boys and girls, and it is done as he willed. I begin to feel rather friendly toward the snail, the voracious animal that eats our flowers, said Jules. I do not care to make you friendly with it. Let us make war on it, since it ravages our gardens. It is our right, but do not let us disdain to learn from it, for it has many beautiful things to teach us. Today I will tell you of its eyes and nose. End of Shells Recorded by Susan Morin, Portland, Maine Chapter 71 of the Storybook of Science This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Storybook of Science by Jean-Henri Fabre Translated by Florence Bicknell The Spiral Snail when the snail crawls, it bears aloft, as you know, four horns. Horns that come out and go in at will, added Jules. Horns that the animal turns every way, said Emil. When you put the shell on the live coals, then the snail sings, Bee, 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 ew, ew. Stop that cruel play, my child. The snail does not sing, it is complaining, in its own way, of the fiery tortures. Its slime, coagulated by the heat, first swells and then shrinks, and the air that escapes by little puffs produces that dying wail. In one of La Fontaine's fables, where there are so many good things about animals, he tells us that the lion wounded by a horned animal straight banished from his realm tis said all sorts of beasts with horns rams bulls goats stags and unicorns such brutes all promptly fled a hare the shadows of his ears perceiving could hardly help believing that some vile spy for horns would take them, and food for accusation make them. Adieu, said he, my neighbor Cricket, I take my foreign ticket. My ear, should I stay here, will turn to horns, I fear, and were they shorter than a bird's, I fear the effects of words these horns the cricket answered why god made them ears who can deny yes said the coward still they'll make them horns and horns perhaps of unicorns in vain shall i protest this hare evidently exaggerated things its ears have remained ears to all observers we do not know whether the snail exiled himself in these circumstances. Man is almost unanimous in regarding as horns what the snail bears on its forehead. You call those horns, the cricket would have exclaimed, being better advised than man. You must take me for a fool. Then they are not horns, asked Jules no my dear they are at once hands eyes nose and a cane for the blind they are called tentacles there are two pairs of unequal length 
the upper pair is the longer and more remarkable right at the end of each long tentacle you see a little black point it is an eye as complete as that of the horse and ox in spite of its minute dimensions what is necessary for making an eye you are far from suspecting it is so complicated i will not try to tell you and yet it is all to be found in that little black point that is scarcely visible that is not all beside the eye is a nose that is to say an organ especially sensitive to odors the snail sees and smells with the tips of its long tentacles i have noticed that if you bring anything near the snail's long horns the animal draws them in this combination of nose and eye can retreat advance go to meet an object and catch odors from all sides to find a similar nose you must go from a snail to an elephant whose trunk is an exceptionally long nose but how much superior the snail's is to the elephant's sensitive to odors and light eye and nose at the same time it can retire within itself like the finger of a glove disappear by re-entering the animal's body or come out from under the skin and lengthen itself like a telescope i have often seen how the snail pulls his horns in observed emil they fold back inward and seem to bury themselves under the skin when something annoys it the animal puts its nose and eyes into its pocket precisely to protect ourselves from too strong a light or an unpleasant odor we shut our pupils and stop up our nose the snail if the light troubles or some smell displeases it sheathes eyes and nose in their covering it puts them into its pocket as emil says it is an ingenious way claire remarked you said too interposed jules that the horn served as a blind man's cane the animal is blind when it has drawn its upper tentacles partly or wholly it then has only the two lower ones which explore objects by the touch better than does the cane of a blind man for they are very sensitive the two upper tentacles besides their functions of eyes and nose also play the part of blind man's cane or better still that of a finger that touches and recognizes objects you see little emil one does not know everything about a snail when one knows its whale on the fire i see who of us would have suspected that those horns are eyes nose blind man's cane fingers all at the same time end of the spiral snail recorded by susan morin portland maine Chapter 72 of the Storybook of Science. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Storybook of Science by Jean Henri Fabre. Translated by Florence Bicknell. Mother of Pearl and Pearls some of the shells you have just shown us said jules shine inside like the handle of that pretty penknife you bought me the day of the fair you know that four-bladed penknife with the mother-of-pearl handle that is plain enough mother-of-pearl 
that pretty substance that shines with all the colors of the rainbow comes from certain shells we use for delicate ornamentation that was once the dwelling of a glary animal near relation to the oyster truly this dwelling is a veritable palace in richness it shines with all imaginable tints as if the rainbow had deposited its colors there this is the shell that furnishes the most beautiful mother of pearl it is called the maliagrina margaritifera outside it is wrinkled and blackish green inside it is smoother than polished marble richer in color than the rainbow all tints are found there bright but soft and changeable according to the point of view that superb shell is the house of a miserable slimy animal in fairy tales the fairies themselves have none to equal it oh how beautiful how beautiful it is every one has his portion in this world the slimy animal has for his a splendid palace of mother-of-pearl where does the meliagrina live in the seas that wash the shores of arabia is arabia very far away inquired emil very far my dear why do you ask because i should like to pick up a lot of these beautiful shells don't dream of such a thing it is too far away and besides they are not to be gathered by every one that wants them to get the meliagrina men have to dive to the bottom of the sea and some of them never come up again and there are people who dare to dive to the bottom of the sea just to get shells asked claire plenty so profitable too is the trade that we should be badly received by the first comers if we took a notion to go and fish with them then those shells are very precious you shall judge for yourself first the inner layer of the shell sawed into sheets and tablets is the mother of pearl that we use for fine ornamentation jules penknife handle is covered with a sheet of mother-of-pearl that was part of the inside of a pearl shell that is the least part of what the precious shell produces there are pearls as well but pearls are not very dear with a few sous i bought a whole boxful to embroider you a purse let us make a distinction there are pearls and pearls the pearls you mention are little pieces of colored glass pierced with a hole their price is very moderate the pearls of the maliagrina are globules of the richest and finest mother of pearl if they are unusually large they attain the fabulous price of the diamond up to hundreds of thousands and millions of francs i don't know those pearls god keep you from ever knowing them for in becoming interested in pearls one sometimes loses common sense and honor it is well though you know how they are produced between the two parts of the shell lives an animal like the oyster it is a mass of slime in which you would find it difficult to recognize an animal it digests however and breathes and is sensitive to pain so sensitive that a grain of dust a mere nothing renders existence painful to it what does an animal do when it feels tickled by some foreign substance it begins to sweat mother-of-pearl around the place that itches this mother-of-pearl piles up in a little smooth ball and there you have a pearl made by the sick slimy animal if it is of any considerable size it will cost a fine bag of crowns and the person who wears it around her neck will be very proud of it but before getting to the neck 
it must be fished for. The fishermen are in a boat. They descend into the sea, one after another, with the aid of a rope to which is tied a large stone that drags them rapidly to the bottom. The man about to dive seizes the weighted rope with his right hand and the toes of his right foot. With his left hand he closes his nostrils. To his left foot is fastened a bag-shaped net. The stone is thrown into the sea. The man sinks like lead. Hastily he fills the net with shells, then pulls the rope to give the signal for ascent. Those in the boat pull him up. Half suffocated, the diver reaches the surface with his fishing. The efforts he has made to suspend respiration are so painful that sometimes blood gushes from his mouth and nose. Sometimes the diver comes up with a leg gone. Sometimes he never comes up. A shark has swallowed him. Some of those pearls that shine in a jeweler's window cost much more than a fine bag of crowns. They may have cost a man's life. If Arabia were at the end of the village, I would not go pearl fishing, declared Emil. To open the shells, they are exposed to the sun until the animals are dead. Then men rummage in the pile, which smells horribly, and get the pearls. There is nothing more to do except pierce them with a hole. One day, said Jules, when we were cleaning the big mill race, I found some shells that shone inside like mother of pearl. We have in our streams and ditches shells in two parts of a greenish black, they are called fresh-water mussels. Their inside is mother-of-pearl. Some very large and living, by preference in mountain streams, even produce pearls. But these pearls are far from having the luster, and consequently the price, of those of the Malia Grina. End of Mother-of-pearl and pearls Recorded by Susan Moran, Portland, Maine Chapter 73 of the Storybook of Science. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Storybook of Science by Jean Henri Fab. Translated by Florence Bicknell the sea do all those beautiful shells you have in the drawer come from the sea asked emil they come from the sea is the sea very large so large that in certain parts it takes ships whole months to go from shore to shore they are fast vessels too especially the steamships they go almost as fast as a locomotive. And what is to be seen at sea? Overhead the sky is here. All around a large blue circular expanse. And beyond that nothing. One travels leagues and leagues. And yet is always in the middle of that blue circle of waters as if one had not advanced the rounded form of the earth and consequently of the seas covering the greater part of it is the cause of this appearance the eye can take in only a small extent of the sea an extent bounded by a circular line on which the dome of the sky appears to rest, and as the circle of the waters is ever being renewed while keeping the same appearance as one advances, it seems as if one remains stationary in the center of the circle where the blue of the sky merges into the blue of the sea. However, by dint of this continued advance, 
one finally perceives a little gray smoke on the line that bounds the view it is land beginning to show another half day's journey and the little gray smoke will have become rocks on the coast or high mountains in the interior the sea is larger than the earth the geography says remarked jules if you divide the surface of the terrestrial globe into four equal parts land will occupy about one of these parts and the sea will take altogether the other three what is under the sea under the sea there is ground the same as under the waters of a lake or stream under sea ground is uneven just as dry land is uneven in certain parts it is hollowed out into deep chasms that can scarcely be sounded in others it is cut up with mountain chains the highest points of which come up above the level of the water and form islands in still others it extends in vast plains or rises up in plateaus if dry it would not differ from the continents then the depth is not the same everywhere in no wise to measure the depths of the water a plummet attached to one end of a very long cord is cast into the sea the length of line unrolled by the plummet in its fall indicates the depth of the water the greatest depth of the mediterranean appears to be between africa and greece in these parts in order to touch bottom the lead unwinds four thousand or five thousand meters of line this depth equals the height of mont blanc the highest mountain in europe so if mont blanc were set down in this hollow was claire's comment its summit would only just reach the surface of the water there are deeper places than that in the atlantic south of the banks of newfoundland one of the best spots for cod fishing the lead shows about eight thousand meters the highest mountains in the world in central asia are eight thousand eight hundred forty meters high those mountains would come up above the surface of the water in the place you spoke of and would form islands eight hundred fifty meters in height finally in the seas about the south pole there are places where the lead shows fourteen thousand or fifteen thousand meters of depth or nearly four leagues nowhere has the dry land any such altitudes between these fearful chasms and the shore where the water is no deeper than the thickness of one's finger all the intermediate degrees may be found sometimes varying gradually sometimes suddenly according to the configuration of the ground underneath on one shore the sea increases in depth with frightful rapidity that sure is then the top of an escarpment of which the sea washes the base on another it increases little by little and one must go a long distance to attain a depth of a few meters there the ocean bed is a plain sloping almost imperceptibly in continuation of the terrestrial plain the average depth of the ocean appears to be from six to seven kilometers that is to say if all the submarine irregularities were to disappear and give place to a level bed like the bottom of a basin made by man the seas while preserving on the surface their present extent would have a uniform layer of water of from six thousand to seven thousand meters in depth 
I get rather bewildered with all these kilometers, complained Emil. Never mind, I begin to understand that there is a great deal of water in the sea. Much more than you could ever imagine. You know the Rhone, the largest river in France? You have seen it at flood, when its muddy waters form a sheet from one bank to the other as far as the eye can reach? It is estimated that in this condition it pours into the sea about five million liters of water a second. Well, if it always preserved that majestic fullness, this large river could not in twenty years fill the thousandth part of the ocean basin. Does that make you understand any better how immense the sea is? My poor head is dizzy at the mere thought of it. What color are the waters of the sea? Are they yellow and muddy like the Rhone? Never, except at the mouth of rivers. Seen in a small quantity, the water looks colorless. Seen in a great mass, it appears of its natural color, greenish-blue. The sea, then, is blue with a greenish tinge, darker in the open sea, clearer near the coasts. But this coloring changes a great deal according to the brightness of the sky. Under a bright sun the calm sea is now pale blue, now dark indigo. Under a stormy sky it becomes bottle green and almost black. End of The Sea Recorded by Susan Morin, Portland, Maine Chapter 74 of the Storybook of Science. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Storybook of Science by Jean Henri Favre. Translated by Florence Bicknell. Wave Salt Seaweeds. Where do waves come from? asked Jules. The sea is very terrible, they say, when it is angry. Yes, my dear Jules, very terrible. I shall never forget those great moving ridges, capped with foam, that toss a heavy ship like a nutshell, carry it one moment on their monstrous backs, then let it plunge into the liquid valley that intervenes. Oh, how small and weak one feels on those four planks, mounting and plunging at the will of the waves. If the nutshell springs a leak under the furious blows of the billows, may the good God have pity on us. The shattered boat would disappear in fathomless depths, in the chasm you told us about claire asked in those chasms from which no one returns the shattered boat would be swallowed up in the sea and nothing of you would be left but a remembrance if there were people left on the earth who loved you so the sea ought always to be calm said jules it would be a pity my child if the sea were always at rest this calm would be incompatible with the salubrity of the seas, which must be violently stirred up to keep them free from taint, and to dissolve the air necessary to their animal and vegetable population. For the ocean of waters, as for the atmosphere or ocean of air, there is need of a salutary agitation of tempests that churn up, renew, and vivify the waters. The wind disturbs the surface of the ocean. If it comes in gusts, it creates waves that leap with foaming crests and break against one another. If it is strong and continuous, it chases the waters in long swells, in waves or surges that advance from the open in parallel lines, succeed one another with a majestic uniformity 
and one after another rush booming on to the shore these movements however tumultuous they may be affect only the surface of the sea thirty meters down the water is calm even in the most violent storms in our seas the height of the biggest waves is not more than two or three meters but in some parts of the south sea the waves in exceptional weather rise to ten or twelve meters they are veritable chains of moving hills with broad and deep valleys between whipped by the wind their summits throw up clouds of foam and roll up in formidable volume with a force sufficient to shatter the largest vessels under their weight the power of the waves borders on the prodigious there where the shore rising vertically from the water presents itself fully to the assault of the sea the shock is so violent that the earth trembles under one's feet the most solid dikes are demolished and swept away enormous blocks are torn off dragged along the ground sometimes thrown over jetties where they roll like mere pebbles it is to the continual action of waves that cliffs are due that is to say the vertical escarpments serving in some places as shore for the sea such escarpments are on the coasts of the english channel both in france and in england unceasingly the ocean undermines them causes pieces to fall down which it triturates into pebbles and makes its way so much farther inland history has preserved the memory of towers dwellings even villages that have had to be abandoned little by little on account of similar landslides and that to-day have entirely disappeared beneath the waves stirred up like that the waters of the sea are not likely to become putrid remarked jules the movement of the waves alone would not suffice to ensure the incorruptibility of sea-water another cause of salubrity comes in here the water of the sea holds in solution numerous substances that give it an extremely disagreeable taste but prevent its corruption then you cannot drink sea-water emil asks no not even if you were pressed with the greatest thirst and what taste has sea-water a taste at once bitter and salt offensive to the palate and causing nausea that taste comes from the dissolved substances the most abundant is ordinary salt the salt we use for seasoning our food salt however objected jews has no disagreeable taste although one cannot drink a glass of salt water doubtless but in the waters of the sea it is accompanied by many other dissolved substances whose taste is very disagreeable the degree of salt varies in different seas a liter of water in the mediterranean contains forty four grams of saline substances a liter of water in the atlantic ocean contains only thirty two an attempt has been made to estimate approximately the total quantity of salt contained in the ocean where the ocean dried up and all its saline ingredients left at the bottom they would suffice to cover the whole surface of the earth with a uniform layer ten meters thick oh what a lot of salt cried emile we should never see the end of it however much we salted our food then salt is obtained from the sea certainly a low level stretch of seashore is selected basins are dug shallow but of considerable extent these are called salt marshes 
then the sea water is admitted to these basins when they are full the communication with the sea is closed the work on salt marshes is done in the summer the heat of the sun causes the water to evaporate little by little and the salt remains in a crystalline crust that is removed with rakes the accumulated salt is piled up in a big heap to let it drain if we should put a plate of salt water in the sun would that be doing in a small way what is done in the salt marshes asked jules exactly the water would disappear evaporated by the sun and the salt would remain in the plate there are lots of fishes in the sea i know said claire small large and monstrous the sardine cod anchovy tuna fish and ever so many more come to us from the sea there are also mollusks as you call them also animals that cover themselves with a shell then enormous crabs with claws bigger than a man's fists and a lot of other creatures that i don't know what do they all live on first they eat one another a good deal the weakest becomes the prey of a stronger one which in its turn finds its master and becomes food for it but it is plain that if the inhabitants of the sea had no other resource than devouring one another sooner or later nourishment would fail them and they would perish therefore in this matter of nutrition things are ordered in the sea much as they are on land plants furnish alimentary matter certain species feed on the plant others devour those that eat the plant so that directly or indirectly vegetation really nourishes them all i understand said jules a sheep browses the grass a wolf eats the sheep and so it is the grass that nourishes the wolf there are then plants in the sea in great abundance our prairies are not more grassy than the bottom of the sea only marine plants differ much from land ones they never have blossoms never anything that can be likened to leaves never any roots they attach themselves to rock by a stickiness at their base without being able to draw nourishment from them. They feed on water and not on the soil. Some resemble sticky thongs, folded ribbons, long manes. Others take the form of little tufted buds, soft topknots, wavy plumes. Still others are slashed in stripes rolled in spirals or shaped like coarse slimy threads some are olive green or pale rose color others are honey yellow or bright red these odd plants are called seaweeds end of waves salt seaweeds recording by susan Morin, portland maine Chapter 75 of the Storybook of Science. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Storybook of Science by Jean Henri Fabre. Translated by Florence Bicknell. Running Waters. I have been told, said Emile that the rhone empties its waters into the sea the rhone does run into the sea returned his uncle it pours into it every second five million liters of water receiving so much water continually does not the sea end by overflowing like a basin when it is too full you are out in your reckoning my dear child the rhone is not the only river that goes to the sea 
In France alone there are the Garonne, Loire, Seine, and many less important ones, and that is only a very small part of the streams that flow into the sea. All the rivers in the world join it. Absolutely all. The Amazon in South America is fourteen hundred leagues long and ten leagues wide at its mouth. What an immense quantity of water it must furnish. Imagine that all the streams in the world, small as well as large, the tiniest brooks, no less than the enormous rivers, flow unceasingly into the sea. You know the little brook with the crabs? In certain places Emil can jump across it. Scarcely anywhere is the water over his knees. Well, the brook goes to the sea exactly as the Amazon does. Every second it casts its few liters of water into it. That is all it can do. But it does not dare, tiny little stream, to make the voyage alone and go and find the sea, the immense sea all by itself. It meets company on the way, joins its thread of clear water to stronger streams, which become rivers by joining their forces. The sea-going river receives tributary streams, and the sea, in receiving the river, drinks the tiny brook. All running waters, said Jews, brooks, torrents, streams, rivers, run into the sea without a break, and that takes place all over the world, so that every second the sea receives incalculable volumes of water? So I come back to Emil's question. How is it that continually receiving so much water, the sea does not overflow? If when full, a reservoir receives from a spring just as much as it lets out through some opening, can this reservoir overflow even when water is always coming in? Certainly not. Losing as much as it receives, it must always keep the same level. It is the same with the sea. It loses as much as it gains, and therefore its level always remains the same. Brooks, torrents, streams, rivers all run into the sea, but brooks, torrents, streams, and rivers also come from the sea. They carry back to the immense reservoir what they took from it, and not a drop more. If the crab brook comes from the sea, interposed Emil, as you say, its waters ought to be salt. But I know very well it is not in the least. Certainly it is not salt. But the brook does not come out of the sea as the water of a ditch comes from a reservoir. In coming from the sea, before becoming what it is, the brook has first passed through the air as clouds. As clouds? As clouds, my little friend. Let us recall something I told you a while ago. The heat of the sun causes water to evaporate. It reduces it to something invisible, to vapor that is dissipated in the air. Seas present a surface three times that of the dry land. Over these immensities there is constantly taking place an enormous evaporation, raising into the air a part of the waters of the sea. The vapor thus formed becomes clouds. The clouds are borne in all directions, letting down snow and rain. This rain and melted snow penetrate the ground, filter down and give birth to springs, which gradually by their union become brooks, streams, and rivers. I see why the water of brooks is not salt, said Jews. Although it comes from the sea, when you put salt water in a plate in the sun, only the water goes away, the salt remains. 
the vapor that rises from the sea is not salt because the salt does not go with it when it forms so streams fed by snow and rain that fall from the clouds cannot be salt what you have just told us is very remarkable uncle observed claire all watercourses rivers streams torrents brooks come from and return to the sea they come from the sea an inexhaustible reservoir that covers with its waters a surface three times larger than that of all the continents joined together from the sea whose abysses go down at some places to the depth of fourteen kilometers and receive an unceasingly the tribute of all the watercourses of the world without ever being taxed beyond their capacity the enormous surface of the sea furnishes the air with vapor which turns into clouds later these clouds dissolve in rain and chased by the wind travel like immense water pots over the ground rendering it fertile in their turn rain and snow precipitated by the clouds give birth to the rivers that carry their waters to the sea in that way a continual current is effected which starting from the sea returns to the sea after having travelled through the atmosphere in the form of clouds watered the earth as rain and crossed continents as rivers the sea is the common reservoir of waters rivers springs fountains every little brooklet all come from and all return to it the water of a dewdrop the water that circulates in the sap of plants the water that forms beads of perspiration on our foreheads all come from the sea and are on their way back to it however small the little drop do not fear that it will lose its way if the arid sand drinks it up the sun will know how to draw it out again and send it to rejoin the vapor in the atmosphere and sooner or later to re-enter the ocean basin nothing is lost nothing escapes the eye of god who has measured the oceans in the hollow of his hand and knows the number of drops of water end of the running waters recording by susan morin portland maine chapter seventy six of the storybook of science this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Storybook of Science by Jean-Henri Fabre Translated by Florence Bicknell Chapter 76 The Swarm Uncle Paul was still talking when they heard a persistent noise in the garden. Pom, 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 pom. As if some smith had set up his anvil under the big elder tree. They ran to see what it was. Jacques was gravely tapping with a key on the watering can. Pom, 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 pom. Mother Ambrosine was busily beating a copper saucepan with a small stone. Pom, 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 pom. Have our two good servants lost their heads that they are giving themselves up, with the most serious air in the world, to this charivari? Without suspending their singular occupation, they exchange a few words. "'They are going toward the currant bush,' says Jacques. "'They look as if they were going away,' answers Mother Ambrosine. "'And the pom, 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 pom is resumed. "'Just then Uncle Paul and his nephews and niece come up. "'One glance is enough to explain everything to Uncle Paul. "'Over the garden there is a kind of red smoke flying, "'which sometimes rises and sometimes sinks, sometimes scatters, and sometimes comes together in a compact mass. A monotonous whirring of wings proceeds from the midst of the red smoke. Jacques and Mother Ambrosine, still tapping, follow the cloud. Uncle Paul looks on, greatly preoccupied. Emile, Jules, and Claire look at each other, surprised at what is going on. The little cloud descends. It approaches the current bush, as Jacques had foreseen, passes around it, examines it, 
chooses a branch. And now, pom, 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 louder than ever. On the branch selected, a round mass is formed, visibly increasing, while the cloud, less and less compact, whirls around. Jacques and Mother Ambrosine stop tapping. Soon there hangs from the branch of the currant bush a large bunch, from which the last comers of the living cloud depart to return an instant later. All is over. One can now approach. Emile, who suspects it is bees, would like to return to the house. His old misadventure with the hive has left him with lively remembrances. To reassure him, his uncle takes him by the hand. Emile bravely approaches the currant bush. What risk can he run with his uncle? Jules and Claire come close also. It is worth the trouble. Now on the currant bush hangs a bunch of bees, all close together. Some belated ones come from here and there, choose a good place, and cling on to the preceding ones. The branch bends under the burden, for there are several thousands on it. The first arrivals, doubtless the most robust, since they will have to support the whole load, have seized the branch with the claws of their forefeet. Others have come and fastened themselves to the hind feet of the first bees, and in their turn have served as suspension points to a third rank, then gradually to a fourth, fifth, sixth, and more still, meantime diminishing in number until finally they are all clinging there by their hands, as one might say. The children stand in wonder before the bunch of bees, whose red down and lustrous wings shine in the sun, but they prudently keep at a distance. "'Do we not run the risk of being stung by getting so near?' Jules asked. "'In their present condition bees rarely make use of their sting. "'If you foolishly went and tormented them, I would not answer for their conduct. "'But leave them alone, and you can watch them at your ease, without any fear. "'They have other cares now than thinking of stinging little curious boys.' "'And what cares? They look very peaceful. One would say they were all asleep.' the grave cares of a people who have no country, and seek to create one for themselves. Bees have a country, then? They have a hive, which amounts to the same thing for them. Then they are looking for a hive to live in? They are looking for a hive. And where do these homeless bees come from? They come from the old hive in the garden. They might have stayed there, instead of going out to seek their fortunes. They could not. The population of the hive increased, and there was not room enough for all. So the most adventurous, under the guidance of a queen, expatriated themselves to found a colony elsewhere. The emigrating troop is called a swarm. The queen who leads the swarm, she must be there in the common bunch? She is. It is she who— alighting on the currant bush, determined the halt of the entire company. These words, country, queen, emigrants, colony, had impressed the children's imaginations. They were astonished to hear the terms of human politics applied to bees. Questions came one after another, but Uncle Paul turned a deaf ear. "'Wait until the swarm is gathered into the hive,' and I will tell you at length the splendid story of the bees. At present I will only answer Claire's question as to why Jacques and Mother Ambrosine tapped on the watering-pot and the saucepan. If the swarm had flown off into the country, it would have been lost to us. It was necessary to induce it to alight on a tree in the garden, and there form itself into a bunch. It has always been thought that this result could be obtained by making a noise. Thus the sound of thunder is imitated, and, as it is said, the bees, afraid of the perils of an approaching storm, quickly seek refuge. I do not believe bees are silly enough to fear a storm because of this tapping on an old pot. They alight where they please, when they please, and not far from the old hive, provided the place suits them. Jacques, with a saw in one hand and a hammer in the other, called to Uncle Paul. With some new boards he was going to make a house for the swarm. By evening the hive was ready. 
At the bottom were three little holes for the bees to go in and out, and inside some pegs for holding the future honeycombs. A large flagstone had been placed against the wall for the hive to stand on. At nightfall they went to the currant bush. The bunch of bees was put into the hive, and a few shakes detached it from the branch. Finally the hive was put in place on its support. The next morning Jules watched to see what the bees were doing. The house had suited them. They were to be seen coming, one by one, out of the little doors of the hive, rubbing themselves a moment in the sun on the flagstone, and then flying away to the flowers in the garden. They were at work. The colony was founded. At a grand council they had decided matters during the night. End of chapter 76 Read by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org On Wednesday, June 5, 2013 In San Diego, California Chapter 77 of The Storybook of Science This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org the Storybook of Science by Jean-Henri Fabre Translated by Florence Bicknell Chapter 77 Wax It was not necessary to remind Uncle Paul of his promise. He took advantage of the first leisure moment to tell the children the story of the bees. A well-peopled hive contains from twenty to thirty thousand bees. That is about the population of our secondary towns. In a town, all cannot follow the same trade. Bakers make bread, masons, houses, carpenters, furniture, tailors, clothes. In short, there are artisans for every occupation. In like manner, in the social economy of the beehive, there are various divisions, namely, that of the mothers, that of the fathers, and that of the workers. For the first, there is only one bee in each hive. This bee, mother of the whole population, is called the queen. She is distinguished from the workers by a large body and the absence of working implements. Her business is to lay eggs. She has as many as twelve hundred at a time in her body, and others keep on forming as fast as the first are laid. What a formidable business is the queen's! But then, what respectful attentions, what tender care the other bees show to their common mother! They feed the noble mother by the mouthful. They give her of the best, for she has not time to gather for herself, and, to tell the truth, would not know how to do it if she had. To lay and lay is her one and only function. The business of father falls to six or eight hundred idlers called drones. They are larger than the workers, and smaller than the queen. Their large bulging eyes join together on the top of the head. They have no sting. Only the queen and the workers have the right to carry the poison stiletto. The drones are deprived of this weapon. One asks, what use are they? One day they form a retinue of honour to the queen, who takes a fancy to fly through the air. Then hardly anything more is heard of them. They perish miserably in the open, or, if they return to the hive, are coldly received by the workers, who look at them unkindly for exhausting the provisions, without ever adding to them. At first they treat them to some smart blows, to show them that idlers are not wanted in a working society. And if they fail to understand, a resolution is taken. One fine morning they kill every one of them. The bodies are swept out of the hive, and that's the end of it. Now come the workers, about twenty or thirty thousand bees to one queen. These are called working bees. They are the ones you see in the garden flying from one flower to another, gathering the harvest. Other workers, a little older and consequently more experienced, remain in the hive to look after the housekeeping and to distribute nourishment to the nurslings hatched from the eggs laid by the queen. There are then two bodies of workers to be distinguished, the wax bees, younger, which make wax, and gather the materials for honey, the nurses, older, which stay at home to bring up the family. 
these two kinds of workers are not mutually exclusive. When young, full of ardor, adventurous, the bee follows the trade of wax-maker. It goes to the fields, seeking viands, visits the flowers, or sometimes is forced to assert itself and unsheath its sting, to put to flight some evil-intentioned aggressor. It sweats wax to make the storehouse, and the little rooms where the brood of young ones is kept. Growing older it gains experience, but loses its first ardor. Then it stays at home, turns nurse, and occupies itself with the delicate task of rearing the young. This preamble of Uncle Paul's, defining the three industrial classes of the bees, appeared to interest the children greatly, and they were surprised to find that insects have such marvellously elaborate social laws. At the very first opportunity Jules began questioning his uncle. The impatient child wanted to know everything at once. "'You say the wax bees make wax. I thought they found it ready-made in flowers.' "'They do not find it ready-made. They make it. Sweat it, that is the word, as the oyster sweats the stone of his shell, as the meleagrina sweats the substance of its mother-of-pearl and its pearls. "'If you look closely at a bee's stomach, you will see it is composed of several pieces or rings fitting into each other.' The stomach of all insects has, moreover, the same formation. This arrangement of several parts fitted endwise is found in the horns, or antennae, as well as in the legs of all insects, without exception. It is precisely to this division into separate pieces fitted endwise that the word insect alludes, its meaning being cut in pieces. Is not the body of an insect composed, in fact, of a series of pieces, placed end to end? Let us come back to the bee's stomach. In the fold separating one ring from the next there is found, underneath, in the middle of the stomach, the wax-producing mechanism. There, little by little, the waxy matter oozes out, just as with us sweat oozes through the skin. This matter accumulates in a thin layer, which the insect detaches by rubbing the stomach with its legs. There are eight of these wax producers. When one is idle, another is working, so that the bee always has some layer of wax at its disposal. And what does the bee do with its wax? It builds cells, that is to say storehouses, where the honey is preserved, and little rooms where the young bees in the form of larvae are raised. It builds its house, then, put in Emile, with the layers of wax taken from the folds of its stomach. And there, you see, the bee shows a very original and inventive mind. It is as if, in order to build a house, we should rub our sides, so as to get from them the blocks of cut stone we needed. The snail, concluded Uncle Paul, has already accustomed us to these original ideas of animals. It sweats the stone, for its shell. End of chapter 77, read by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org, on Sunday, June 9th, 2013, in San Diego, California. Chapter 59 of the Storybook of Science. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The Storybook of Science by Jean-Henri Fabre. Translated by Florence Bicknell. The Cells. In order to store the supply of honey and lodge the larvae, the bees build with their wax little rooms called cells, open at one end and closed at the other. They are six-sided and arranged with perfect regularity. In geometrical terms, each would be called a hexagonal prism, or a prism with six facets. Do not be surprised at this introduction of terms belonging to the beautiful and severe science of form, of geometry in short, Bees are geometricians of consummate skill. Their constructions have required the exercise of the highest intelligence. 
all the power of human reason was necessary to follow, step by step, the insect's science. I will return presently to this fine subject, a very difficult one, but I will try to make it intelligible to you. The cells are placed horizontally, back to back and end to end, in pairs with the closed ends joining. Furthermore, they are arranged side by side in greater or lesser number, and they touch each other by their flat faces, each one of which serves as a partition wall for two contiguous cells. The two layers of cells, back to back at their closed ends, constitute what is called a comb or honeycomb. On one side of this comb are found all the entrances to the cells of the corresponding layer. On the other side, the cells of the second layer open. Finally, the honeycomb is suspended vertically in the hive, with half its openings to the right and half to the left. It adheres by its upper edge to the roof of the hive, or to the bars that cross it inside. One comb is not enough when the population is numerous. Others are constructed like the first. The various combs arranged parallel to one another leave free intervening spaces. These are the streets, the public squares, the thoroughfares on which the openings of the two layers of cells belonging to the neighboring combs give, as the doors of our houses open on the right and left of a street. There the bees circulate, going from one door to another to deposit their honey in the cells used as storehouses, or to distribute nourishment to the young larvae lodged one by one in other cells. In these same public places they assemble when necessary, hold consultations, and deliberate on the affairs of the community. They are, for example, among the nurses going from door to door to see whether the larvae need feeding, and the wax bees rubbing themselves vehemently to extract the wax and begin to build, is plotted the extermination of the drones. There, when the birth of a new queen menaces the hive with civil war, the project of immigration ripens. There, but let us not anticipate. Let us return to the cells. I am longing to know the whole story of the strange story of the bees, Jules broke in. Patience. First of all, let us see how the cells are constructed. The bee that feels that it is supplied with the materials for making wax rubs itself and extracts a sheet of wax from the folds of its rings. With the little layer of wax between its teeth, that is to say, between its two mandibles, it squeezes through the press of its comrades. Let me pass, it seems to say. See, I have something to work with. The crowd makes way. The bee takes its place in the middle of the workyard. The wax is kneaded between its mandibles, pounded to pieces, then flattened out into a ribbon, pounded again, and once more kneaded into a compact mass. At the same time, it is impregnated with a kind of saliva that gives it flexibility. When the material is at the proper stage, the bee applies it bit by bit. To cut off the surplus, the mandibles serve as scissors. The antennae, in continual motion, serve it as probe and measuring compasses. They feel the wall of the wax to judge its thickness. They plunge into the cavity to find out its depths. What exquisite touch in this pair of living compasses to bring to successful completion a construction so delicate and regular. Moreover, if the worker is a novice, master bees are there to watch it with an experienced eye, to seize on the slightest fault at once and hasten to remedy it. The maladroit worker modestly steps aside and watches in order to learn. The trick learned, it sets to work again. With thousands of wax bees working together, a comb two or three decimeters wide is often a day's work. Uh, you told us, said Claire, that the cells are especially remarkable for their geometrical arrangement. I am just coming to that magnificent topic, but I shall treat it briefly, I warn you. You are far from being able to follow yet in its superior beauties the architecture of the bees. Yes, my dear Jules, the wax house of a poor insect, to be well understood, demands knowledge that very few persons possess. Ah, uh, you may study ever so long before you are able fully to understand this marvel. For the present, 
Here is what I will tell you. The cells serve some as storerooms for the honey, others as nests for the little ones. They are made of wax, a material that the bees cannot procure in indefinite quantities. They must wait until the stomach sweats a little layer of it, and it forms very slowly, at the expense of the insect's very substance. The bee builds with the materials of its own body. It impoverishes itself in sweating the wherewithal to construct the cells. You can judge from that how precious a thing wax is to the bees, and with what strict economy they must use it. And yet the innumerable family must be lodged. Honey storerooms must multiply to supply the wants of the community. Moreover, it is necessary that these storerooms and nurseries take up as little room as possible, so as not to encumber the hive, and to permit free circulation to the twenty or thirty thousand inhabitants of the city. In fine, one of the hardest problems is presented to the bees. They must make the greatest possible number of cells, in the least space and with the least wax possible. Well, friend Jules, do you think you could solve the bees' problem? Alas, uncle, I hardly understand the statement of it. To economize the wax, a very simple way suggests itself at the outset. It is to make the partitions of the cells very thin. You may be quite sure that bees are equal to this elementary requirement. They make the wax wall scarcely as thick as a sheet of paper. But that is not enough. It is necessary above all to take the form into consideration and to seek the most economical shape. Let us try. What shape shall we give the cells to satisfy the conditions of economy in space and wax? First of all, let us suppose them to be round. Let us trace on paper some circles of equal size and touching one another. Between three of these contiguous circles there will always be an unoccupied space. The round form will not do, then, for the cells, since there will always be a waste of space or empty intervals. Let us make them square. We will trace equal squares on the paper. In going about it properly, we can arrange the squares side by side without leaving any empty spaces between them. Look at the inlaid floor of this room, composed of little square red bricks. These bricks leave no intervening spaces. They touch on every side. The square form, therefore, suits the first condition, namely, to utilize all the space. But here's where another difficulty arises. Cells fashioned on the square model would not hold enough honey for the quantity of wax used in constructing them. In order to increase their capacity, you must increase as much as possible the number of their facets. I will not try to demonstrate to you this beautiful truth. It is beyond your intelligence. Geometry affirms it. Let us consider it a fact. Starting from that, the choice is soon made. Among all the regular figures that can be placed side by side without leaving an unoccupied space, you must choose that which has the greatest number of sides, for that is the one that will hold the most honey for the same quantity of wax used. Geometry teaches that the only regular figures that can be arranged without waste of space are the three-sided figure, or triangle, the four-sided, or square, and the six-sided, or hexagon. That is all. No other regular figures touch all around so as to leave no empty spaces between them. So it is, then, in the hexagonal form, or form with six sides, that the cells can occupy collectively the least space, use the least wax, and hold the most honey. Bees, knowing these things better than anyone else, make hexagonal cells, never any other kind. Then bees have reason, remarked Claire, like ours, even superior, if they can solve such problems? If bees constructed their cells after a premeditated, considered, calculated plan, it would be something alarming, my dear child. Animals would rival man. Bees are profound geometricians because they work unconsciously under the inspiration of the sublime geometrician. Let us stop this talk, which I fear you have not wholly understood. 
but at any rate I have opened your eyes to one of the greatest wonders of this world. End of The Cells Chapter 79 of the Storybook of Science This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Storybook of Science by Jean Henry Fabre, translated by Florence Bicknell. Chapter 79 Honey The bee is diligent. At sunrise it is at work far from the hive, visiting the flowers one by one. You already know what it is in flowers that attracts insects. I have told you about the nectar, the sweet liquor that oozes out at the bottom of the corolla to entice the little winged people and make them shake the antlers on the stigma. This nectar is what the bee wants. It is its great feast, the great feast also of the little ones and the queen mother. It is the prime ingredient of honey. How carry home a liquid so that others may enjoy it? The bee possesses neither pitcher, jar, pot, nor anything of the sort. I am wrong. Like the ant that carries the plant lice's milk to the workers, it is provided with a natural can, stomach, haunch, or crop. The bee enters a flower, plunges to the bottom of the corolla, a long and flexible trunk, a kind of tongue that laps the sweet liquor. Droplet by droplet, drawn from this flower and that, the crop is filled. The bee at the same time nibbles a few grains of pollen. Moreover, it proposes to carry a good load of it to the hive. It has special utensils for this work. First the down of its body, then the brushes and baskets that its legs supply. The down and the brushes are used for harvesting, the baskets for carrying. First the bee rolls delightfully among the stamens to cover itself with pollen. Then it passes and repasses over its velvety body the extremities of its hind legs, where is found a square piece bristling on the inside with short and rough hairs which serve as a brush. The grains of pollen scattered over the down of the insect are thus gathered together into a small pellet, which the intermediary legs seize in order to place it in one or other of the baskets. They call by this name a hollow edged with hair on the outside of its hind legs, a little above the brushes. It is there the pellets of pollen are piled up as fast as the brushes gather them on the powdery down. The load does not fall, because it is held by the hairs that edge the basket. It is also stuck against the bottom. The queen and the drones have not these working implements. Utensils are useless to those who do not work. The little masses one sees on the hind legs of bees visiting the flowers are loads of pollen contained in the baskets, asked Jules. Exactly. The bee has lapped so much sweet from the corollas, has brushed its pollen-powdered side so often, that finally the crop is full and the baskets are running over. It is time to go back to the hive, time for a flight made heavy with so much treasure. Let us take advantage of the time used in the return journey to inform ourselves about the origin of honey. The bee carries with it a sugary liquor in its crop, two balls of pollen in its baskets. But all that is not yet honey. Real honey the bee prepares with the ingredients that we have just seen it gather. It cooks it, lets it simmer in its crop. Its little stomach is better than a real pot for carrying. It is an admirable alemic in which the liquid has been lapped up and the grains of pollen that have been nibbled are worked by digestion and converted into a delicious marmalade, which is honey. This skillful cooking finished, the content of the crop is honey. The bee arrives at the hive. If by good fortune the queen mother is encountered, the workman does reverence to her and offers her, from mouth to mouth, a sip of honey, 
the first from its crop. Then it seeks an empty cell, inserts its head into the storeroom, projects its tongue, and spits out the contents of its stomach. And there you have real honey disgorged by the bee. Is it all disgorged? Emil asked. Not all. The crop's contents are usually divided into three parts. One for the nurses that remain in the hive to do the housework, a second for the little ones still in the nest, a third kept by the bee that has prepared the honey. Must it not have food in order to work well? Then bees feed on honey? Without a doubt. You imagine, perhaps, that bees made honey expressly for man? Undeceive yourself. Bees make honey for themselves and not for us. We plunder their riches. What becomes of the little balls of pollen, inquired Jules? The pollen enters into the making of honey and serves as a nourishment for the bees. The working bee, on its return from harvesting, puts its hind legs into a cell where there is neither larva nor honey, and with the end of its middle legs it detaches the pellets and pushes them to the bottom. In repeating its trips, it ends by filling both the cell in which the honey is disgorged and that in which the pollen is stored. The nurses draw on these provisions when they go from cell to cell, distributing small portions to the little ones. Hence also they get their own food. In fact, the whole population finds its resources there when bad weather comes. Flowers do not last all the year, and moreover there are days of rest, rainy days when the bees cannot go out. It is necessary, therefore, to have pollen and honey in reserve and to have a good supply. So when flowers are plenty and the harvest exceeds immediate requirements, the workers gather honey and pollen untiringly and store it in cells, which they close as soon as full with a cover of wax. These are reserve supplies, safeguards for the future in case of scarcity. The wax cover is religiously respected, it would be a state crime to touch it prematurely. In time of want, the seals are removed and each one draws from the open comb, but with restraint and sobriety. The comb exhausted, they break the seals of another. How are young bees fed? was Jules' next question. When the cells destined to serve as nests are prepared in sufficient number by the wax bees, the queen mother goes from one to another dragging with much effort her fruitful womb. The nurses form a respectful retinue. One egg, one only, is laid in each cell. In a few days, from three to six, there comes from this egg a larva, a little white worm without legs, bent like a comma. Now begins the nurses' delicate work. They must every day and several times a day distribute nourishment to the little worms, not honey or pollen in its natural state, but a preparation of increasing strength such as delicate stomachs need at first. It is, in the beginning, a liquid paste, almost tasteless, then something sweeter, and finally pure honey, nourishment at its full strength. Do we offer a slice of beef to a crying baby? No, but milk first and then pap. Bees do the same. They have honey, strong food for the strong, and weaker nourishment, tasteless pap, for the weak. How do they prepare these more or less substantial foods? It would be hard to say. Perhaps they mix pollen and honey in different proportions. In six days the larvae, called brood comb, have attained their development. Then, like the larvae of other insects, they retire from the world to undergo metamorphosis. In order to protect its suffering flesh at the critical moment of its transfiguration, each larva lines the inside of its cell with silk, and the working bees close the cell with a cover of wax. In the silk-lined case, the skin is cast off and the passage to the state of nymph accomplished. Twelve days later, the nymph awakes from the deep sleep of the second birth. It shakes itself, 
tears its narrow swaddling clothes, and comes forth a bee. The wax cover is gnawed by the enclosed insect, as well as by the working bees lending a ready hand to the resuscitated. And the hive counts one more citizen. The newborn bee makes its toilet a little, dries its wings, polishes its body, and is off to work. It knows its trade without having had to learn it. Wax bee in its youth, nurse in its old age. End of chapter 79 Recording by Sharon Kilmer, Rio Medina, Texas Chapter 80 of The Storybook of Science This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Storybook of Science by Jean-Henri Fabre Translated by Florence Bicknell Chapter 80 The Queen Bee the eggs destined to give birth to queens are laid in special cells, much more spacious and solid than those where the working bees hatch. Their shape is, in a general way, that of a thimble. They are fastened to the edge of the combs, and are called royal cells. "'When she lays in a large or small cell,' asked Jules, "'does the queen know whether the egg is that of a queen or of a working bee?' "'She does not know.' She does not need to know. There is no difference between the queen eggs and working bee eggs. Its treatment alone decides the issue for the egg. Treated in a certain manner, the young larva becomes a queen, on whom depends the future prosperity of the hive. Treated in another way, it becomes one of the working people, and is furnished with brushes and baskets. Bees make their queens at will. The first egg laid would suffice to fill the royal functions worthily, if treated with that end in view. And what does not treatment, or education, accomplish with us in our tender years? It does not make us kings or peasants, but honest people, which is better, and scoundrels, which is worse. It need not be said that the bees' pedagogic methods are not the same as ours. Man, as much mind as matter, if not more, turns his attention above all to the generous impulses of the heart, the noble aspirations of the soul. With bees, education is purely animal, and is governed by the dictates of the belly. The kind of food makes either the queen or the working bee. For the larvae that are to discharge the functions of royalty, the nurses prepare a special pap, a royal dish of which only they know the secret." Whoever eats of it is consecrated queen. This strengthening nourishment brings about a greater development than usual. For that reason, as I told you, the larvae destined for royalty are lodged in spacious cells. For these noble cradles, wax is used with prodigality. No more hexagonal parsimonious forms, no thin partitions. A large and sumptuously thick thimble— Economy is silent, where queens are concerned. Is it, then, without the actual queen's knowledge that bees make other queens? Yes, my friend. The queen is excessively jealous. She cannot endure in the hive any bee whose presence may bring the slightest diminution to her royal prerogatives. Woe to the pretenders that should get in her way! Ah, you come to supplant me, to steal from me the love of my subjects. Ah, this, ah, that. It would be something horrible, my children. Read the history of mankind, and you will see what disasters crowned heads, brought to bay, can inflict upon nations. But the working bees are strong-minded. They know that nothing lasts in this world, not even queens. They treat the reigning sovereign with the greatest respect, without losing sight of the future which demands other queens. They must have them to perpetuate the race. They will have them, whether or no. To this end the royal pap is served to the larvae in the large cells. Now in the spring, when the working bees and drones are already hatched, a loud rustling is heard in the royal cells. They are the young queens trying to get out of their wax prisons. 
The nurses and wax beasts are there, standing guard in a dense battalion. They keep the young queens in their cells by force. To prevent their getting out, they reinforce the wax enclosures. They mend the broken covers. It is not time for you to show yourselves, they seem to say. There is danger. And very respectfully they resort to violence. Impatient, the young queens renew their rustling. The queen mother has heard them. She hastens up in a passion. She stamps with rage on the royal cells. She sends pieces of the wax covers flying, and, dragging the pretenders from their cells, she pitilessly tears them to pieces. Several succumb under her blows, but the people surround her, encircle her closely, and little by little draw her away from the scene of carnage. The future is saved. There are still some queens left." In the meantime, wrath is excited, and civil war breaks out. Some lean to the old queen, others to the young ones. In this conflict of opinions, disorder and tumult succeed to peaceful activity. The hive is filled with menacing buzzings. The well-filled storehouses are given over to pillage. There is an orgy of feasting with no thought of the morrow. Dagger thrusts are exchanged. The queen decides on a masterstroke. She abandons the ungrateful country, the country that she founded, and that now raises up rivals against her. Let them that love me follow me. And behold, her proudly rushing out of the hive, never to enter it again. Her partisans fly away with her. The emigrating troop forms a swarm, which goes forth to found a new colony elsewhere. To restore order, the working bees that were away during the tumult come and join the bees left in the hive. Two young queens set up their rights. Which of them shall reign? A duel to the death shall decide it. They come out of their cells. Hardly have they caught sight of each other, when they join in shock of battle, rear upright, seize with their mandibles each an antenna of the other, and hold themselves head to head, breast to breast. In this position each would only have to bend the end of its stomach a little to plunge its poison sting into its rival's body. But that would be a double death, and their instinct forbids them a mode of assault in which both would perish. They separate, and retire. But the people gathered around them prevent their getting away. One of them must succumb. The two queens return to the attack. The more skilful one, at a moment when the other is off guard, jumps on its rival's back, seizes it where the wing joins the body, and stings it in the side. The victim stretches its legs and dies. All is over. Royal unity is restored, and the hive proceeds to resume its accustomed order and work. The bees are very naughty to force the queens to kill one another until there is only one left, commented Emile. It is necessary, my little friend. Their instinct demands it. Otherwise civil war would rage unceasingly in the hive. But this hard necessity does not make them forget for one moment the respect due to royal dignity. What is to prevent their getting rid of the superfluous queens themselves, even as they so unceremoniously get rid of the drones? But this they are very careful not to do. What one of their number would dare to draw the sword against their sovereigns, even when they are a serious encumbrance? The saving of life not being in their power, they save honour, by letting the pretenders fight it out among themselves. There is always the possibility that the queen, at a time when she is reigning alone and supreme, may perish by accident, or die of old age. The bees press respectfully around the deceased, they brush her tenderly, offer her honey as if to revive her, turn her over, feel her lovingly, and treat her with all the regard they gave to her when alive. It takes several days for them to understand, at last, that she is dead, quite dead, and that all their attentions are useless. Then there is general mourning. Every evening, for two or three days, a lugubrious humming, a sort of funeral dirge, is heard in the hive. The mourning over, they think about replacing the queen. A young larva is chosen from those in the common cells. It was born to be a wax-bee, but circumstances are going to confer royalty upon it. 
the working bees begin by destroying the cells adjacent to the one occupied by the sacred larva, the queen that is to be, by unanimous consent. The rearing of royalty requires more space. This being secured, the remaining cell is enlarged and shaped like a thimble, as willed by the high destiny of the nursling it contains. For several days the larva is fed with royal paste, that sugary pap that makes queens, and the miracle is accomplished. The queen is dead. Long live the queen. The story of bees is the best you have told us, declared Jules. I think so too, his uncle assented. That is why I kept it till the last. What, the last? cried Jules. "'You are not going to tell us any more stories?' asked Claire. "'Never, never?' Emile put in. "'As many as you wish, my dear children, but later. "'The grain is ripe, and the harvest will take up my time. "'Let us embrace and finish for the present.' "'Since Uncle Paul, occupied with his duties in the harvest field, "'no longer tells stories in the evening, "'Emile has gone back to his Noah's Ark.' He found the hind and the elephant moldy. From the time of the story of the ants, the child had suspended his visits. And that's the end of chapter 80, read by Kara Schallenberg, www.kra.org, on Sunday, June 9, 2013, in San Diego, California. And it is also the end of The Storybook of Science by Jean-Henri Fabre, translated by Florence Bicknell.